and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This episode is the fifth in a planned six-episode arc on the French Revolution. If you want to hear the whole story from the beginning, you can start with episode 57, Bastille Day, and go from there. These episodes will live in the cloud indefinitely, so there's no hurry. Really. Some of them are longer than I'd intended, and all I can say is that I started with a six-episode outline, and the later episodes have proven to be far more involved than I'd initially envisioned, but I'm sticking to the six-episode format come hell or high water. Based on my download numbers, you guys seem just fine with long episodes, so maybe this is a good thing. Finally, a quick reminder that Patreon memberships are only $1 a month for the time being. Click the link in the description, sign up, and you'll get access to all 25 of my video episodes, including the Christmas special I just did on the Battle of the Pyramids. You'll also get access to the Relevant History Discord server, but sign up soon. This is a limited time offer, and at some point in the future, probably this summer, I'll be raising the price back to $5 for video episodes, although $1 members will still get access to the Discord server. And if you don't want to pay for anything, I get it. There are a ton of great creators out there, and we all have to pick and choose, so you can still support the show by sharing it with your friends. It's the best way to help grow the channel. Now let's get started. Where we left off at the end of the last episode, France is under attack from all sides. At war with a coalition that includes Austria, Prussia, the Netherlands, Britain, Spain, Portugal, and most of Italy. A sweeping military draft called the Levee en masse is all that's keeping the Republic from collapsing. A British naval blockade has cut off foreign trade, and hyperinflation has made everyday goods unaffordable for the average person, leading the National Convention to impose a set of price controls known as the General Maximum. The Radicals, led by Paris Commune member Jacques Hibert, are imposing a system of de-Christianization throughout the country, which is implemented by representatives on mission in every department. These programs have provoked a swath of rebellions that the Republican Army is finally getting under control at the end of 1793. At the same time, the government is divided between three factions. The far-left Hibertists, led by Jacques Hibert, the center-left Dantonists, led by Georges Danton, and the Authoritarian Committee of Public Safety which is dominated by the unofficial triumvirate of Maximilien Robespierre, Louis Saint-Just, and Georges Couthon. In order to suppress internal rebellions, the committee has instituted a series of mass arrests and executions that comes to be known as the Reign of Terror. Thousands of people, including most leading members of the old Girondin party, have already been executed. The Committee of Public Safety increases its power on December 4, 1793, via a law called the Law of Fourteen Frimaire, so named because December 4th is the 14th of Frimaire on the Republican calendar. This sweeping law abolishes local elected committees throughout France and centralizes power in the hands of representatives on mission who were in turn forbidden from taking action without the approval of the Committee of Public Safety. The press is formally censored, with the committee and its representatives allowed to close any newspaper or journal that does not meet its standards. Debate, such as it is, is essentially restricted to the halls of Jacobin clubs, who act as sort of advisory bodies to the representatives on mission. The National Convention still officially rules France, but only via its power to overrule the Committee of Public Safety, which is a cumbersome process that takes time and a series of debates, so the Convention is effectively hamstrung by its own democratic nature. 
Another measure makes it illegal to criticize the government or its ministers, which leads to another round of mass arrests. Eventually, it is members of the government themselves who will become victims of the reign of terror. This is perhaps inevitable as factional infighting turns from battles at the ballot box to public denouncements and show trials. In his book, The French Revolution from Enlightenment to Tyranny, British historian Ian Davidson writes, quote, My impression is that significantly more than 40% of those who played any notable role in the revolution may have died a violent death. During my work on this book, I gradually built up a list of people whose names occurred in various episodes of the revolution, and by the end it totaled 290 names. Of this total, 84 or 29% were executed mainly by guillotine, and 41 or 14% died violently in other ways, some of them by suicide to avoid the guillotine. In other words, 43% of those who played a big enough role in the revolution for history to have recorded their names had a violent death. This list is, of course, wholly unscientific. It is just a stochastic sample of those who cropped up in the course of my reading. Almost all of these deaths occurred in 1793 through 94. End quote. Some members of the government see this coming, most notably Georges Danton, who returns from semi-retirement in November to rejoin the National Convention. He and his followers are now calling for an end to the terror and a return to constitutional government. His old friend and business partner, Camille Desmoulins, publishes an editorial where he says, quote, Liberty is no nymph of the opera, nor a red cap, nor a dirty shirt and rags. Liberty is happiness, reason, equality, justice, the declaration of rights, your sublime constitution still hibernating. Would you have me recognize this liberty, have me fall at her feet, and shed all my blood for her? Then open the prison doors to the 200,000 citizens whom you call suspects. Do not think that such a measure would be fatal to the public. It would, on the contrary, be the most revolutionary that you could adopt. You would exterminate all your enemies by the guillotine? But was there ever greater madness? Can you destroy one enemy on the scaffold without making two others among his family and friends? I am of a very different opinion from those who claim that it is necessary to leave the terror the order of the day. I am confident that liberty will be assured, and Europe conquered, as soon as you have a committee of clemency. End quote. Because of this call for mercy, Danton's party becomes known as the Indulgence, but their influence will be short-lived. For once, Hibert and Robespierre agree on something. Terror must remain the order of the day. Hibert believes this because he believes the sans-culottes will come out of the terror victorious against the upper classes. So far during the revolution, the mob has ruled Paris, and Hibert sees the guillotine as their greatest weapon. Robespierre's view is one of growing paranoia. He sees counter-revolutionaries behind every bush and under every rock. And while he has previously opposed the death penalty, he truly believes that terror is the only way for Enlightenment ideals to crush the old monarchical system once and for all. Hibert and Robespierre get a big assist from none other than the indulgence themselves, who get themselves involved in a major political scandal. See, the revolutionary government has banned the existence of joint stock companies, which are corporations owned by several individuals and governed by a board of directors. 
One of the wealthiest French joint stock companies is the French East India Company, which has held a monopoly over French trade in India and China, and now the company is being broken up and its assets are being sold off, ostensibly to fund the government. On November 14, 1793, a few weeks before the Law of 14 Frimaire is passed, a member of the convention named François Chabot comes to Robespierre with news of a scandal. As a matter of fact, he literally wakes Robespierre up and drags him out of bed to deliver this news. Now, The East India Company liquidation scandal is a complex business scandal that would take some time to explain. It involves very modern-sounding things like stock shorting and insider trading, but here's the gist of it. A handful of convention members, tasked with overseeing the company's liquidation, have instead taken bribes. Chabot himself has taken a 100,000 livre bribe, which he assures Robespierre that he only accepted in order to learn the names of the other conspirators. Robespierre sees through this, and within a few days, Chabot and the other conspirators have all been arrested. This would only merit a footnote if it weren't for the involvement of a leading indulgent named Fabre de Glantine the actor and playwright who had named the months of the Republican calendar. Deglantine has already been running a campaign against foreign bankers, who he sees as enemies of the revolution. He, in turn, has been placed in charge of an investigation of the so-called foreign plot. But on January 4, 1794, During a search of the home of one of the delegates involved in the East India Company scandal, a document authorizing the entire bribe-taking scam is found, and this document has been signed by none other than Deglantine. When this is revealed at a meeting of the Jacobin Club, he tries to go to the podium to defend himself, but Robespierre, who is already at the podium, cuts him off. Quote, if Fabre de Glantine has his subject all prepared, mine is not yet finished. I beg him to wait. There are two plots, one of which has the object of frightening the convention and the other of troubling the people. The conspirators who lie behind these hateful schemes seem to be fighting one another, and yet they work together in defending the cause of the tyrants. I ask this man, who is never seen without his reading glasses in his hand, and who is so very skilled at explicating plots and theatrical works, to be so kind as to explain himself here. We shall see how he acquits himself with this one. End quote. Deglantine is left speechless, is expelled from the Jacobin Club, and is arrested a few days later. Now, Deglantine is a friend of Camille de Moulin, who has written a few articles defending him and has also, as we've seen, been a leading critic of the terror as well as of Jacques Hibert. De Moulin has already been publicly rebuked by Robespierre for his indulgent ways, and now that he's been tied to the East India Company liquidation scandal, even if only by association, his influence in the National Convention vanishes overnight. The loss of both Deglantine and de Moulin defangs the indulgent movement, and Georges Danton stands alone against the terror, unable to stop it without influential allies. The next victims of the terror will not be the indulgents, but the Hibertists, See, the revolution is about to take one final lurch to the left, and this is going to backfire. On February 26th, 1794, young Louis Saint-Just gives a speech to the convention that begins with a condemnation of the indulgence. Quote, 
Those who demand the freedom of aristocrats do not want the republic at all, and they fear for them. It is a flagrant sign of treason, this pity displayed towards crime, in a republic that can only be based on inflexibility. It is enough for them to be virtuous in writing. They exempt themselves from probity. They grow fat on the spoils of the people, glutted with it. They insult the people, and they march and triumph on the coattails of crime for which crime they seek to excite your compassion. Surely, it is impossible to remain silent about the impunity of these great offenders, who wish to do away with the scaffold because they fear mounting it themselves. End quote. Then, Louis Saint-Just changes tack. Instead of calling for more heads, he calls for a public aid program for all good citizens who have been impoverished by the revolution. Over the next few days, in dribs and drabs, he releases a plan to confiscate the property of all arrested suspects and redistribute that property to the poor. This is to be done by local district communes, each of which is to be responsible for drawing up its own list of poor people. Less cynical people would see Saint-Just's so-called Ventos decrees as an effort to feed the poor and establish the basis for a social welfare system. Hibert and his allies in the Cordelgui Club see it as a delaying tactic to keep the sans-culot from revolting again. As evidence of this, he argues in a public speech that the men involved in the East India Company scandal have not yet been executed. Quote, when 61 guilty men and their companions remain unpunished and do not fall beneath the sword, can you still doubt that a faction exists that wants to destroy the rights of the people? Well then, since it exists, since we can see it, what are the means of delivering ourselves from it? Insurrection. Yes, insurrection. And the Cordelier will not be the last to give the signal that will strike the oppressors dead. End quote. Following this speech, given on March 7, 1794, the Cordelier Club symbolically covers their copy of the Declaration of the Rights of Man with a black cloth, to be removed only when the enemies of the revolution have been destroyed. Several times already, we've seen the Paris mob dictate the course of the revolution. Well, so have the members of the National Convention and the Committee of Public Safety. On March 12th, Louis Saint-Just gives a report to the convention condemning, quote, "...the faction of indulgence, who want to save the criminals, and the foreigners' faction." which makes a great noise because it cannot do otherwise without revealing itself, but which turns severity against the defenders of the people. End quote. By the foreigner's faction, Saint-Just is referring to none other than Jacques Hibert, who is himself involved with a number of foreign bankers, as well as a couple of generals who had failed to put down the Vendée Rebellion but had gotten rich from confiscated goods. Keep in mind also that while Hibert presents himself as a man of the people, he has gotten rich during the revolution and lives in a big mansion with his wife and daughter. To Saint-Just, Robespierre, and others, this can mean only one thing. Foreign bankers and counter-revolutionaries have been paying him off. Now the Committee of Public Safety moves quickly to put an end to both factions, the Hibertists and the Indulgents, by playing them against each other. This series of events is meant to unify the government behind Robespierre and his allies once and for all and is appropriately known as the War Against the Factions. And thanks to Hibert's little threat of another popular insurrection, it's the Hibertists who will go first. The day after Saint-Just's speech, March 13th, Jacques Hibert is arrested. 
including Hibert himself, 21 people are tried before a Paris criminal court on March 21, 1794. Some are public officials accused of siphoning off food aid intended for the Paris poor. Some are bankers accused of acting as foreign agents and supporting a sans culot uprising to destabilize the French government. Six others, plus Hibert, are directly accused of inciting an insurrection. All 21 men are found guilty, except for one defendant who is revealed to have been a police informant the entire time. Three days later, on March 24th, Hibert and his allies go to the guillotine. For a man who had openly cheered the killing of thousands of others, Hibert dies like a coward, visibly shaking and crying on his way up to the scaffold. His death is not made easier by the executioners, who decide to have a little fun with the crowd by adjusting the blade so it falls just short of Hibert's neck and subjecting him to three fake drops of the blade before finally readjusting it and taking his head. So much for the Hibertists. Next in line for removal are the Indulgents, who Robespierre initially has no desire to get rid of. This is in part because he's close with some of the major leaders. In fact, he went to college with Camille Desmoulins, and while it would be a stretch to say that Robespierre and Danton are friends, he's defended Danton several times. As recently as December 3, 1793, Danton had received boos at a Jacobin Club meeting for opposing the execution of some former Vendée rebels. Robespierre had come to his defense saying, quote, Does no one raise their voice? Well, I shall do so. Danton, do you not know that the more courage and patriotism a man has the more the enemies of the public cause pursue his downfall? Do you not know, do you not all know, citizens, that this method is infallible? End quote. If only Robespierre heeded his own advice, the revolution may have taken a different turn in 1794. But as it stands, he and the Committee of Public Safety are the subject of an intense lobbying campaign by the Paris Commune. The more radical members of the committee are also lobbying Robespierre to do something about the indulgence. In the run-up to Hibert's execution, these men take it as a foregone conclusion that in exchange for Hibert's head, they will receive Danton's in turn. Robespierre himself is on board with the idea of prosecuting Fabre d'Eglantine and the others involved in the East India Company liquidation scandal, but he has to be coaxed into going along with executing the giant of the revolution. On the night of March 22, 1794, two days before Hibert's execution, Georges Danton and Maximilien Robespierre will meet for the last time in private, over dinner at the house of a mutual friend. Danton urges Robespierre to put an end to the terror, release the hundreds of thousands of arrested suspects, and move forward with the rest of the convention in a spirit of brotherhood. They've had their disagreements, but they're all veterans of the revolution and all this infighting will only bring them all down. In response to Danton's argument, Robespierre says, I suppose that a man of your moral principles would not think that anyone deserved punishment. And Danton answers, And I suppose that you would be annoyed if none did. They part with a hug, but the whole time, Robespierre has been taking notes. And as with many things in history, there are different ways to interpret this. Ruth Skur, Robespierre's biographer, 
takes this meeting as the final straw for Robespierre, who has failed to extract any concessions from an old friend and knows that his own head will be on the line if he doesn't agree to bring charges against Danton. His note-taking goes unmentioned, likely something Skur takes for granted since Robespierre has always been a fastidious note-taker. For David Laude, Danton's biographer, this final meeting is a trap by Robespierre, and all of his notes are taken with an eye to incriminating the giant of the revolution. The only person who knows the truth is Robespierre, and he's not around to tell us. But this is a good example of how our understanding of history can depend just as much on how you interpret a series of events as it does on the events themselves. Danton goes to the National Convention on March 29th to have another talk with Robespierre. But when he enters the chambers, he sees Robespierre having what appears to be a friendly conversation with Camille de Moulin. Convinced that Robespierre isn't plotting anything against them, Danton goes home. He is sorely mistaken. The next day, March 30th, eight days after the dinner meeting and six days after the execution of the Hibertists, the Committee of Public Safety and the Committee of General Security, which is another committee we'll discuss more in a minute, they both send a list of accused to the Revolutionary Tribunal and order their arrest. That night, a friend comes to warn Danton that he is one of the accused about to be arrested and urges him to run. Danton paraphrases Socrates in his refusal, saying, one doesn't carry the country on the soles of one's shoes. Danton, Desmoulins, and three other leading indulgents are arrested in the wee hours of the morning. Ian Davidson describes the charges. Quote, On April 1, 1794, the convention listened in silence as St. Just read out the lengthy charge sheet against Danton and his fellow accused. It consisted almost entirely of circumstantial innuendos alleging past intrigues with Mirabeau, who had died three years earlier of overwork and debauchery at the age of 42. Covert dealings with the court, now all dispersed or in exile, secret relationships with de Maurier, now languishing in an Austrian prison, treacherous transactions with the Girondins, most of whom were now dead, attempts to save the royal family, who were now dead in prison or in exile, insidious campaigns for clemency and peace, silent resistance to all revolutionary measures, links with corruption and friendships with suspect foreigners. End quote. Needless to say, these charges are all trumped up. In order to confuse the matter and ensure a conviction, these five men, including de Moulin and Danton, are to be tried alongside Fabre d'Eglantine, François Chabot, and eight other men who are connected with the East India Company liquidation scandal. This is to be a trial based not merely on innuendo, but on a conspiracy theory that opponents of the revolution are undermining it from within, enriching themselves with bribes and corruption while acting as the agents of foreign powers. To justify this, Louis Saint-Just tells the National Convention that all anti-revolutionary plots are related, like waves on the ocean that crash together and create a larger wave. One member of the convention makes a motion for Danton to be allowed to defend himself before the convention and have the opportunity of a speedy acquittal without needing to go to trial. But Robespierre shuts him down, saying, quote, The question is to know whether the self-interest of a few ambitious hypocrites is to prevail over the interest of the French people. He has spoken of Danton, 
because he believes, no doubt, that a privilege attaches to this name. No, we do not want any privileges. We do not want any idols. We shall see today whether the convention will be able to break a supposed idol that long ago turned rotten, or whether, in its fall, it will crush the convention and the French people. The friends of Danton wanted me to think that if Danton were in danger, the menace would reach me, too. They represented him to me as a man to whom I ought to adhere, as a shield that could defend me, a rampart without which I would be exposed to the darts of my enemies. I have been written to. Danton's friends have sent me letters. They have persecuted me with their speeches. They thought the memory of an old friendship, former faith and feigned virtues, would induce me to slacken my zeal and my passion for liberty. Well, I declare that not one of these motives has made an impression on me. I declare that, were it true that Danton's dangers were to become my own, that if they were to cause the aristocracy to take another step towards seizing me, I would not look upon that circumstance as a public calamity. What are dangers to me? My life belongs to my country. My heart is free of fear. And if I died, it would be without reproach and ignominy. I, too, was Petion's friend. As soon as he was unmasked, I abandoned him. I also had connections with Roland. He betrayed, and I denounced him. Danton wants to take their place, and he is no longer in my eyes anything but an enemy of the people. End quote. As we'll see, there are many men in the National Convention who still consider Danton a friend and don't want him executed. But Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety have just shown how powerful they are. If they can arrest Danton, they can arrest anybody. The motion to allow Danton to defend himself before the convention is easily defeated by a show of hands. This may be a show trial, but Danton is prepared to make it a show for the ages. When asked to identify himself, he says, quote, I am Georges Jacques Danton, 34 years old, born in R.C. Sorobe, barrister, convention deputy, soon to be the void, and my name will dwell in the pantheon of history. End quote. Camille Desmoulins introduces himself even more poetically. Quote, I am Camille Desmoulins. I am 33 years old, the age of the Sanculo Jesus Christ when he died. End quote. To ensure a conviction, the prosecution swears in only seven jurors instead of the usual 12, all of them Sanculo who are still angry about the execution of Jacques Hibert. Then, the prosecutors spend the first day of the trial focusing on the financial scandal. Instead of Danton's impassioned speechifying, the jurors are treated to dry, boring testimony about bribes, stock shorting, and the liquidation of company and government assets. This is intended not just to put them to sleep, but again to confuse the issue of the financial scandal and the trumped-up charges against Danton and Desmoulins. The fireworks begin to go off late in the day, when a 16th defendant is added to the docket. In his book, The Giant of the French Revolution, British author David Laudet writes, quote, General Westerman, brought to the tribunal after the others and unsighted in the group indictment, protested that he had neither been notified of charges against him nor been asked to identify himself. Herman, the judge, shrugged, calling his request a pointless matter of form. 
Danton surged to his feet with a roar. Form? We're all of us here only for form. The tribunal erupted in laughter as Herman called on the defendants to obey their duty to respect the court, at which Danton rose again, shouting, And I, your honor, remind you of yours. We have the right to speak here. He was acting as his own defense counsel, having refused a court-appointed advocate. Turning to the jury, he added with a monstrous scowl, I'm the one who created this tribunal, so I know something about it. Herman rang his bell for order, but the hubbub continued. Don't you hear the bell? he asked, glaring around the court. Still on his feet, Danton countered, A man defending his life does not care about a damn bell. No, he keeps shouting. If we are allowed to speak, and freely, I am sure to beat my accusers. And if the French people are what they ought to be, I shall be asking for clemency for those who accuse me. End quote. The prosecution once again shifts to the East India Company scandal and Danton sits in stone-faced silence throughout the second day of the trial. On the third day, April 3rd, Judge Herman orders the prosecution to present their charges against Danton. He laughs openly at the charge of conspiring to restore the monarchy. After all, he comes from the Cordelier Club and was one of the first people to advocate for a truly Republican government. Not long ago, he had sat on the far left of the national government. When he demands proof, the prosecution responds with hearsay and rumors and brings no witnesses. Judge Herman then proposes a short recess, which Danton agrees to on the condition that he will be allowed to bring witnesses on his own behalf. The judge refuses, and Danton says, quote, You refuse me, witnesses? All right, I shall no longer defend myself. A thousand pardons, I must add, if I have been overheated. It's my character. The people will tear my enemies to shreds before three months are out. End quote. Danton's prediction is accurate. As we'll see, he's only off by a few weeks. But during the recess, the prosecutor sends a note to Robespierre that the trial is getting out of hand and an acquittal is possible. Louis Saint-Just comes up with a solution. He goes to the National Convention with a report that Camille Desmoulins' wife is plotting a coup to break the prisoners out of jail and overthrow the Committee of Public Safety. Not only does this result in her arrest, but the report provides a pretext for the prosecuting attorney to ask for an immediate verdict. Danton and his allies are convicted by the jury without even having the chance to mount a defense. In prison, away from public eyes, Danton, Desmoulins, and others have already known that they are dead men walking. Desmoulins writes a letter to his wife saying, quote, Despite my torment, I believe that there is a God. My blood will efface my sins, my human weaknesses, and God will reward what is good in me, my virtues and my love of liberty. I will see you again one day, O Lucille. Adieu, Lucille, my life, my soul, my divinity on this earth. I feel the shore of life retreating before me. I still see, Lucille. I see you. My crossed arms grip you. My bound hands embrace you. My severed head rests upon you. I am going to die. End quote. Desmoulins is right about his own death, of course. But Lucille never receives his letter. She's already in prison for the made-up jailbreak plot and will be guillotined only a week after her husband. As for Danton, he leaves no final testament, but a fellow prisoner named Riouf writes down some things he overhears the great man say in his last hours. 
Quote, This very day a year ago, I set up the Revolutionary Tribunal, but I ask pardon for it of God and men. It was not intended to be a scourge on humanity, but to prevent a recurrence of the 2nd and 3rd of September. Let us be terrible so that the people do not need to be. I leave everything in an appalling mess. The entire government is completely at odds. In the midst of such insanity, I am glad not to have put my name to certain decrees. People will know I wanted nothing to do with them. Not one of them knows the first thing about government. A pity I can't leave my balls to that eunuch Robespierre and my legs to the cripple Couthon. The committee might live a little longer. But Robespierre will follow. I will drag him down. The proof that that bastard Robespierre is a Nero. He never spoke to Camille Desmoulins in such terms of friendship as the day before he was arrested. In revolutions, authority rests with the worst criminals. They'll be shouting, Long live the Republic, when they see me go past. End quote. Most famously, Danton references Roman mythology when he says, The revolution, like Saturn, devours its own children. As with other victims of the reign of terror, the end comes quickly for Danton, Desmoulins, and the rest of the 15 defendants. As soon as the verdict is issued on the afternoon of April 5th, they're loaded into open carts and paraded across Paris to the execution ground. But things are different this time around. The Paris crowd, which is usually raucous for these high-profile executions, is eerily silent. If leading members of the government are eager to be rid of Danton, the people seem to differ. Danton himself maintains his composure, standing in the cart rather than sitting and glaring at the crowd. From time to time, he consoles de Moulin, who is crying and keeps saying his wife's name, Lucille. Only once does Danton have an outburst, and that's when the execution cart passes Robespierre's house. Then he points at the house and shouts, You're next! You will follow me. As with Marie Antoinette, there are unconfirmed rumors that Danton secretly receives absolution from a Catholic priest while he stands on the scaffold awaiting his turn at the guillotine. This is unlikely, but it also wouldn't be out of character for a man who opposed the revolution's dechristianization program. What is known for sure is this. Desmoulin is executed third of the fifteen men, and Danton last. When Herault de Seychelles, another of the condemned, tries to embrace him before his own death, the executioner, the ever-present, ever-silent Charles-Henri Sanson, pulls the two apart. Fool, Danton says. You won't keep our heads apart in the bucket. By the time his own turn comes, Danton is splattered with the blood of his co-defendants. His last words to Sanson are as defiant as the rest of his personality. Show my head to the people. It is worth a look. A minute later, Sanson is indeed showing Danton's head to the crowd. So dies the giant of the revolution. And while Robespierre, Saint Just, and the other members of the Committee of Public Safety don't know it, the last best hope of French Republican government dies with him. For the time being, though, the Committee of Public Safety has won. And with that victory, the triumvirate of Maximilien Robespierre. Louis Saint-Just and Georges Couthon have near-total control of the government. While the reign of terror continues to claim victims, Robespierre 
does try to undo some of the damage of the past few months. His first target is the cult of reason, Hibert's atheist religion with its revolutionary saints. To replace it, Robespierre establishes yet another revolutionary religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being, which is officially announced on May 7, 1774. The Cult of the Supreme Being is a deistic religion, meaning broadly that its adherents believe in a divine creator, but that this creator takes no active part in human affairs. Instead, Robespierre believes that mankind must use the Creator's gifts of reason and personal virtue to improve their own lot in life. The National Convention expresses the new religion's three main tenets in its law of May 7th establishing the cult. Quote, the French people recognize the existence of the Supreme Being and the immortality of the soul. They declare that the best service of the Supreme Being is the practice of man's duties. They set among the most important of these duties the detestation of bad faith and tyranny. By punishing tyrants and traitors, by caring for the unfortunate, by respecting the weak, defending the oppressed, doing unto others all the good one can, and not being unjust towards anyone. End quote. Article 7 of the law outlines a series of festivals to be held on the 10th day of each 10-day week in the Republican calendar. Each one has a certain theme that people are supposed to contemplate. Quote, The supreme being in nature, the human race, the French people, the benefactors of mankind, the martyrs of freedom, liberty and equality, the republic, the liberty of the world, patriotism, hatred of tyrants and traitors, truth, justice, modesty, glory and immortality, friendship, temperance, courage, good faith, heroism, impartiality, stoicism, love, conjugal fidelity, fatherly affection, motherly love, filial piety, childhood, youth, manhood, old age, misfortune, agriculture, industry, our ancestors, posterity, happiness, end quote. The greatest of these festivals is to be held on the 20th of Prairial, which in the year 1794 falls on June 8th. This is the festival of the Supreme Being, and much like earlier revolutionary festivals, there are celebrations in every French city. Also like other festivals, the largest celebration by far is held in Paris, and it's here where Robespierre really begins to outdo himself. The festival and most of its accoutrements are designed by Jacques-Louis David, a revolutionary painter and architect who produces many of the period's most famous paintings. Today, David's most well-known works are historical, like his paintings of the death of Marat, the death of Socrates, and Napoleon crossing the Alps, which is one of the most iconic depictions of Napoleon ever created. But, at the time of the Festival of the Supreme Being, David's paintings have only been seen by a lucky few, while the symbolic works at the festival are going to be seen by all of Paris. Appropriately, Robespierre orders the Paris guillotine moved to the street outside the demolished Bastille to keep it away from the festival. It remains there for only a few days before local residents complain of blood getting into their well water and the smell of bodies festering in the summer heat. The guillotine will then be relocated to the city's fringes, except when it's occasionally moved back downtown for a few special executions. The Festival of the Supreme Being begins outside the Tuileries Palace, 
where Robespierre, who is now the president of the National Convention, gives a grand speech. Quote, It has finally arrived, the forever fortunate day that the French people consecrate to the Supreme Being. The world that he created has never offered a spectacle so worthy of his regard. He has seen tyranny, crime, and imposture reign on earth. At this moment, he sees an entire nation that is combating all the oppressors of humankind suspend the course of its heroic labors in order to raise its thoughts and its vows towards the great being who gave it the mission to undertake and the strength to execute it. Is it not he whose immortal hand, by engraving in the heart of man the code of justice and equality, traced there the death sentence of tyrants? Is it not he who, from the beginning of time, decreed the republic and placed on the order of the day, for all centuries and all peoples, liberty, good faith, and justice? He did not create kings to devour humankind. He didn't create priests to harness us like vile animals to the chariot of kings, and to give an example of baseness, selfish pride, perfidy, avarice, debauch, and falsehood. He created the universe to make known his might. He created men to mutually assist and love each other, and to arrive at happiness by the path of virtue. It is he who placed remorse and fear in the breast of the triumphant oppressor, and calm and pride in the heart of the innocent oppressed. It is he who forces the just man to hate the wicked, and the wicked to respect the just man. It is he who adorned the face of beauty with modesty, so as to make it even more beautiful. It is he who makes maternal entrails palpitate with tenderness and joy. It is he who bathes with delicious tears the eyes of a son pressed against his mother's breast. It is he who silences the most imperious and tender passions before the sublime love of the fatherland. It is he who covered nature with charms, riches, and majesty. All that is good is his work or is him. Evil belongs to the depraved man who oppresses or allows his like to be oppressed. The author of nature ties together all mortals in an immense chain of love and felicity. May the tyrants who dared break it perish. Republican Frenchmen, it is up to you to purify the land they have soiled and to recall the justice they have banished. Liberty and virtue sprang together from the breast of the divinity, and one cannot remain among men without the other. Generous people, do you want to triumph over your enemies? Practice justice and render the divinity the only cult worthy of it. People, today let us give ourselves over, under its auspices, to the just transports of a pure happiness. Tomorrow, we will again combat vices and tyrants. We will give the world the example of Republican virtues. And in doing this, we honor it again. End quote. At this point, Robespierre takes a torch and burns a cardboard sculpture that Jacques-Louis David has constructed to represent atheism. When it burns away... It leaves behind a white sculpture of a woman who represents wisdom, although some witnesses report that the sculpture is now sooty from the flames. Robespierre continues, It has vanished into nothingness, this monster that the genius of kings vomited onto France. May all the crimes and misfortunes of the world disappear along with it. Armed either with the daggers of fanaticism or the poisons of atheism, kings always conspire to assassinate humanity. If they can no longer disfigure the divinity by superstition so as to associate it to their misdeeds, they strive to banish him from earth in order to reign there alone with crime. End quote. 
Robespierre goes on for a bit longer and then concludes, quote, Frenchmen, you are fighting kings, and so you are worthy of honoring the divinity. Being of beings, author of nature, the stupefied slave, the vile henchman of despotism, the perfidious and cruel aristocrat insults you by invoking you. But the defenders of liberty can abandon themselves with confidence within your paternal breast. Being of beings, we don't have to address to you unjust prayers. You know the creatures who have come from your hands. Their needs no more escape your gaze than do their most secret thoughts. The hatred of bad faith and tyranny burns in our hearts along with the love of justice and the fatherland. Our blood flows for the cause of humanity. This is our prayer. These are our sacrifices. This is the cult we offer you. End quote. From here, the members of the National Convention lead the people across Paris to the Champ de Mars. Robespierre, as president of the convention, leads the parade and behind the members of the government comes an ox-drawn carriage loaded with a printing press and a plow, representing intellectual and manual labor. Another cart carries a chorus of blind schoolboys who sing a specially written hymn to the divine being. Young women with infants at the breast also have a special place in the parade, representing the future of the French people. At the Champ de Mars, the people gather around a giant cardboard and plaster mountain, also designed by Jacques-Louis David. At its peak is an oak tree, representing liberty. Well, it's more of a sapling, really, but this is intentional. The tree is to be planted in this spot, and future generations of French people are intended to gather under its branches at future annual festivals. Alongside the tree is a sculpture of Hercules, representing the Revolutionary Army, carrying in his hand a smaller sculpture of liberty, which represents France bringing liberty to the world. Throughout the sunny afternoon of June 8, 1794, the gathered crowd sings more hymns to the Supreme Being, as well as a rendition of La Marseillaise. One of the hymns to the Supreme Being runs as follows, quote, Father of the universe, supreme intelligence, benefactor unknown to blind mortals, you revealed your being to recognition, who alone raised your altars. Your temple is on the mountains, in the air, on the waves. You have no past, you have no future, and without occupying them, you fill all the worlds which cannot contain you. Everything emanates from you, great and first cause. Everything is purified in the rays of your divinity. On your immortal worship, morality rests, and on morals, freedom. To avenge their outrage in your offended glory, August Liberty, this scourge of the perverse, emerged at the same moment from your vast thought with the plan of the universe. Mighty God, she avenged alone your injury. From her cult itself instructing mortals, lifted the thick veil which covered nature, and came to absolve your altars. O oh, you whom from nothingness like a spark made the bright star of the day spring into the air, do more. Pour your immortal wisdom into our hearts. Embrace us with your love. From the hatred of kings animates the fatherland, drives out vain desires, the unjust pride of the ranks, corrupting luxury, base flattery, more fatal than tyrants. Dispel our errors, make us good, make us just. Reign, reign beyond the limitless. Chain nature to your august decrees. Leave freedom to man. End quote. As the festival nears its conclusion, Robespierre, 
wearing a blue coat, a tricolor sash, and a large hat with a feather in it, climbs to the top of the mountain. He then descends through a crowd of tricolor-wearing people, who part before him in an orchestrated display. One by one, he has executed all of his enemies. He has suppressed the power of the National Convention, and instead of a government of the people, we have one man literally descending from the mountain to deliver wisdom and liberty to the people. The symbolism of this display is disputed. Many at the time compare it to Moses descending from the mountain to bring the law of God to the Israelites, and this seems like an apt comparison and one the French people would have been familiar with. For others, the idea of Robespierre delivering liberty or wisdom is offensive, and his detractors will soon write that he's setting himself up as Pope of a new religion. Well, I wouldn't dispute this either. Robespierre's behavior goes even further. More than a king, more than a pope, he represents what he would call inflexible virtue, the perfect revolutionary man. Anyone who's read their Roman history will be familiar with some emperor's obsession with the cult of Sol Invictus, the unconquered son. These men set themselves up as god-kings, and that's what I think Robespierre is doing here, even if he doesn't admit it to himself. How else to explain this combination of narcissism and divine worship? His ego is no doubt boosted by a religious fanatic named Catherine Theo who has spent the last several decades prophesying that she will give birth to a new messiah. She's also made conflicting prophecies that this new messiah will simply appear on the streets of Paris, and now in her 80s, Catherine Theo has amassed a small but vocal following in Paris, and one of her followers, Dom Girl, had helped plan the Festival of the Supreme Being. To many Parisians, this makes it look as if Theo's little cult has also endorsed Robespierre as their new messiah. Given everything I've just said, you could be forgiven for thinking that Robespierre's ascent as a revolutionary god-king is inevitable. But even before the Festival of the Supreme Being, he's begun to overreach— and when he walks down the mountain through the crowd, he only has 51 days left to live. To understand why, we need to look at other things that are happening in May through July of 1774. On May 10th, 1774, Three days after the National Convention declares the cult of the Supreme Being to be the new official French religion, the Committee of Public Safety strikes a blow against the Paris Commune. If you've been paying attention at all to these last few episodes, you know how crucial the Paris mob has been to the Revolution. It's the mob that stormed the Bastille that forced Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette to move from Versailles to Paris, that overthrew the monarchy and blew up the 1793 Constitution. Most recently, the Paris mob forced the National Convention to expel the Girondins. Robespierre fears the mob as much as anyone, and is determined to shut it down. So, on May 10th, the Revolutionary Tribunal arrests the mayor of Paris, a popular Hibertus named Jean-Nicolas Pache. Rather than order a snap election, the Committee of Public Safety appoints a new mayor, Jean-Baptiste Edouard Lescaut Fleuriot, a former deputy prosecutor of the Revolutionary Tribunal and, more importantly, a loyal follower of Maximilien Robespierre. 
In a similar move, several leading members of the Paris Commune are removed and replaced by Robespierre's allies. Rather than acting as an independent entity, the Paris government is now an extension of the Committee of Public Safety in all but name. The same day, Robespierre orders the closing of a bunch of debate clubs called the Societes Populaires. Technically, these clubs have already been illegal since the banning of non-Jacobin debate clubs several months before. But the National Convention had previously tried to cut off the powers of the Paris mob by simply limiting the days on which they could hold their sectional assemblies, so the Societes Populaires had popped up as a sort of unofficial substitute. Some of these unofficial clubs reincorporate as branches of the Jacobin Club, while others disappear altogether. Either way, the Jacobin Club has re-established a monopoly on debate in the city of Paris, ensuring that debates will be led by members of the bourgeoisie class. What Robespierre has forgotten is that while the mob has destroyed revolutionary leaders, it has also created and sustained them. The mob that marched on the Bastille was led by men like Camille Desmoulins, who became part of the vanguard of revolutionary thought. The Women's March on Versailles was allegedly organized by agents of Philippe Egalité, the first prince of the blood. The later mobs had been led by far-left agitators like Jacques Hibert and brought them to power. Concerning Robespierre's seizure of power in Paris, Ian Davidson writes, quote, This move may have tipped the odds fatally against Robespierre. For while the immediate effect was to reinforce the concentration of political power at the center, it also underlined, in the most public way possible, the fundamental split between the sans-culot and the bourgeois Montagnards. Political contact between Robespierre and the mass of the sans-culot, whose popular movement had brought him to power, was now largely lost. And Saint-Just virtually admitted as much, saying, The revolution is frozen. When it came to the moment of crisis, a few weeks later, and the choice had to be made between Robespierre and his enemies, an essential minority of the sans culot were no longer behind him. End quote. If that's not enough, Robespierre will further alienate the sans culot by lowering the maximum wage on July 23rd. This move is made by the Paris Commune, not the national government, but... Since he's replaced the Paris Commune leadership with his own hand-picked people, Robespierre's fingertips are all over it. In his book, A People's History of the French Revolution, French Marxist historian Eric Hazan writes, quote, At the beginning of Florial, end of April, the Commune tried to bring wages back to the legal maximum. The municipality sent in the police against the workers who were causing trouble or even going on strike. After the tobacco grinders, the United Workers' leaders at the Paris ports were arrested on the orders of the Commune, 9 Florial, 28 April, which equated their organization with a reconstitution of the banned corporations. On 19 Prairial, 7 June, the Committee of Public Safety had the workers' leaders in the war factories imprisoned. These were subject to a quasi-military regime, and particularly disgruntled as their wages had been held by decree to the legal minimum. On a report from Barrere, 22 Prairial, the convention directed the public prosecutor to pursue counter-revolutionaries engaged in criminal maneuvers in the workshops manufacturing assignats, arms, gunpowder, and saltpeter. Finally, on 5 Thermidor, July 23rd, the municipality set a maximum wage to apply throughout the Commune of Paris, a measure that infuriated the salaried population as it meant a reduction that was in many cases substantial. End quote. Robespierre's second big mistake 
is the passage of the so-called Law of 22 Prairie All. Named for the day on which it passes the National Convention, June 10, 1794. Written by Georges Couthon, this law eliminates the right of the accused to have a lawyer and establishes the death penalty for a number of new charges. These charges include advocating monarchy, criticizing the Republican government, spreading false news, embezzling, war profiteering, and other offenses like outraging morality. Judges and juries are also stripped of the ability to impose lesser sentences like exile. Those found guilty are to be executed full stop. The Law of 22 Prairial marks the beginning of the so-called Great Terror, during which more than 1,300 people will be executed in Paris. In six and a half weeks, the guillotine will claim as many lives as it had claimed in the nine months since the beginning of the Reign of Terror on September 5, 1793. That's a massive increase in executions, but it still pales in comparison to the heights the terror has already reached in Lyon, Nantes, and Toulon. Still, it brings home to the people of Paris just how dangerous their revolutionary government has become. In their book, The Age of Napoleon, The Story of Civilization, Volume 11, American historians Will and Ariel Durant write, quote, The people no longer went to executions. These had become so common. Rather, they stayed home and watched every word they spoke. The social life nearly ceased. The taverns and brothels were almost empty. The convention itself was reduced to a skeleton. Out of its original 750 deputies, only 117 now attended, and many of these abstained from voting lest they compromise themselves. Even committee members lived in fear that they would fall under the axe of the new triumvirate, Robespierre, Couthon, and Saint-Just. End quote. As with the reign of terror more broadly, it would be impossible to do justice to all of the victims of the Great Terror, but I'll give you a few examples. The first is someone we've already met, Louis XVI's lead defense attorney, Guillaume Chrétien de Lemoguignon de Malesherbe. Malesherbe is an Enlightenment liberal, who as a young man had defended Voltaire and other Enlightenment thinkers from the Ancien Regime's press censorship. But he had committed the unforgivable crime of defending the king's life at trial and he's rewarded with a one-way trip to the guillotine. The second is Isaac René Guy Le Chapelier, who had written the Le Chapelier Law of June 14, 1791, that banned workers' trade unions. His crime is political moderation, which is a big no-no in the all-or-nothing environment of the Great Terror. Once again underscoring the bourgeoisie nature of the revolution, Le Chapelier is killed, but his law is not. Trade unions will remain illegal in France until 1864. The third example is a group of 16 Carmelite nuns, collectively known as the Carmelites of Compiègne, after the Paris suburb in which their convent had been located. On September 14, 1792, the convent had been forcibly closed and the sisters had relocated to a set of apartments in Paris where they had continued their religious life. Now, these are not political activists. The Carmelite order is dedicated to a life of quiet prayer and reflection, but any defiance of the revolution, no matter to what extent, has now become unacceptable. The nuns are arrested on June 22, 1794, and after a show trial on July 17, all 16 of them are sent to the guillotine. And the remarkable thing about these women is that they go to their deaths singing religious hymns. 
they all sing as one after another is executed. And their superior, Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, who is the last to die, sings alone until the blade falls. According to witness accounts, the small group of spectators watches in total silence. The sisters are then buried in a mass grave with 128 other people, 24 of whom had been executed the same day. This mass murder is what Robespierre has called swift, severe, indomitable justice. And it's the kind of thing that begins to turn even the most enthusiastic revolutionaries against him. The third factor working against Robespierre isn't a mistake on his part, but a success by the revolutionary army. As you might expect... People are willing to put up with draconian laws when France itself is in danger. This has been a big part of Robespierre's appeal throughout the Reign of Terror. He's constantly going on against foreign plots to undercut the Republic. By Robespierre's own logic, when France is safe, there's no need to cut off so many heads. Such a reversal of fortune takes place in the early summer of 1794. Starting in early spring, the Austrian, Prussian, Dutch, and British coalition members had been steadily advancing along the northern front, in yet another attempt to take Paris and put an end to the French Revolution by force of arms. The Allied army had stalled out in early May after occupying the fortress of Charleroi in southern Belgium, not far from the French frontier. But so far, the French had failed to push them back. Four times, on May 13th, May 24th, June 3rd, and June 16th, French armies had attacked the fort and been repulsed. This is bad news for the French, since they need to penetrate into enemy territory. See, thanks to the British naval blockade, the entire nation is running into supply issues. In March, Lazare Carnot, the Committee of Public Safety's military genius who had organized the levée en masse, had written to his generals, quote, I cannot hide from you that we are lost if you do not very soon cross over into enemy territory to get food and resources of all kinds, because France cannot long bear the strange state in which it finds itself at present. We must live off the enemy or perish. End quote. In fact, the French Republic is now relying on supplies mostly from the United States, which at the time is a minor regional power, and France is doing this just to stay afloat. On June 1st, 1794, British Admiral Richard Howe, who you may remember from the American Revolution, had defeated a French fleet in the Fourth Battle of Ushant, better known as the Glorious First of June, in which the British fleet lost no ships and had captured or sunk seven French ships of the line. But despite the British triumphalism over this tactical victory, it's also a French strategic victory. See, the French fleet had been protecting a supply convoy from the Americas and had held the British off long enough for the convoy to reach port and deliver vital food and military supplies to France. This is only one supply fleet, though. The British blockade remains in place, and the French still need to advance into enemy territory if they're going to pillage enough to keep fighting and win the war. On June 25th, only nine days after their most recent defeat, a French army of 90,000 men has once again surrounded Charleroi which is only defended by 2,800 men. The rest of the Austro-Dutch army, consisting of around 70,000 men, has redeployed to the north near the town of Rouveroy, which their commanders, Prince William V of Orange and Prince Josias of Coburg, believe to be the true target of the new French advance. 
The Austrians and Dutch have also refused help from a British army commanded by the Duke of York, who, in the face of this baffling decision, sits uselessly on the Scheldt River to the northwest. Surrounded and with no prospect of immediate relief, the commander of Charleroi surrenders. He has tried to draw out negotiations and stall for time, but the French negotiator, none other than Louis Saint-Just, has threatened the Austrians with a massacre if they don't surrender unconditionally. The next day, June 26, 1794, the French and Austro-Dutch forces meet at the nearby town of Flores in a battle that lasts for 15 hours. The battle itself isn't all that important. The two sides fight to a stalemate and inflict more or less equal damage on each other. But during the battle, Prince Coburg learns that Charleroi has already fallen to the French. Unwilling to spend more men in an attempt to retake the fortress, he withdraws his army eastward back into Germany. This isn't just a move by some rogue general, it's a strategic decision by the Austrians to abandon Belgium altogether. Remember, they've spent the past century trying to trade the territory away, it has little strategic value to them, and their armies are needed in Germany and northern Italy, which are both under French attack, and both of which are of far more importance to Austrian interests. But... Coburg's withdrawal is disastrous for the First Coalition at large. The Duke of York is now left stranded in Belgium with a force far too small to fight the French on his own. So he and his Dutch allies withdraw back north out of the Austrian Netherlands slash Belgium into the Netherlands proper. And this leaves Belgium completely undefended. Over the course of the next month, French armies will methodically take one city after another, and all the money from those cities and all the food from the surrounding countryside is now at the disposal of the French war effort. At the same time, French armies are also advancing against the Spanish in the south. Now, they're fighting in the Pyrenees and in that mountainous region. Advancing just means taking a few forts. But even without huge material gains, it's clear that the Spanish and Portuguese pose no real threat to the French Republic. When Louis Saint-Just returns to Paris from Flores on June 28th, he expects to find the city celebrating the army's great victories. Instead, he finds a quiet, sullen city whose mood has been dampened by the ongoing Great Terror. At the end of June, Robespierre once again begins verbally attacking other members of the government. He threatens to remove the head of the War Department, Lazare Carnot, from the committee and give Saint-Just control of the army a threat that the apolitical Carnot only laughs off. Robespierre then goes into seclusion for three weeks, from July 1st through the 23rd, 1794. The reasons for this seclusion are unclear. Most historians believe that Robespierre is making himself scarce because of conflict within the government, which I'll get into more in a second. But... Others make a convincing case that he's having a nervous breakdown. He's already secluded himself twice during the spring, once for two weeks prior to the purge of the Hibertists, and again for a full month following the executions of Danton and his allies. He excuses all of these absences on the basis of health, and his contemporaries say that he seems to age a decade during the Reign of Terror. But are we talking about a decline in physical health or a decline in mental health? Barring his absences, he doesn't behave like a man with a physical illness. 
On the other hand, his growing paranoia, his performance at the Festival of the Supreme Being, and his final speeches all paint a picture of a man whose nerves are at their breaking point. Anyway, Robespierre and his allies on the Committee of Public Safety are now involved in an ongoing effort to subordinate the Committee of General Security to their control. The Committee of General Security actually predates the Committee of Public Safety, but its powers are more limited. It's basically a national police command, charged with punishing crime and arresting counter-revolutionaries. Because it technically has authority over French police forces, the Committee of Public Safety has always needed the Committee of General Security's cooperation to bring charges against people before the Revolutionary Tribunal. This hadn't been a problem during the early part of the Reign of Terror, but it had become more difficult after the purge of the Hibertists because the Committee of General Security is actually more radical than the Committee of Public Safety, and many of its members were Hibert's friends. They had only agreed to arrest Hibert if Robespierre would agree to the arrest of Danton and the Indulgence, which is a big reason why Danton had been arrested. Anyway, Robespierre, Saint-Just, and Couthon had organized a rival committee on April 16th to effectively replace the Committee of General Security. And this committee had been under the Committee of Public Safety's direct control. When this failed, they had switched over in June to trying to assert direct authority over the Committee of General Security. In Robespierre's absence in early July, talks between the two committees are ongoing, and it looks like they're going to patch things up and come to a power-sharing agreement. Even Robespierre's fellow triumvirate members, Louis Saint-Just and Georges Couthon, seem to be on board. Robespierre isn't just making enemies on the Committee of General Security. He's also recalled a number of the National Convention's representatives on mission due to their roles in the terror and the de-Christianization campaign. Now, there are a lot of these guys, one for each French department, but it's worth mentioning a few of them to give you an idea of who we're dealing with. The first of the recalled representatives on mission is Jean Lambert Tallien. Tallien had started his career as one of the most vigorous of the Jacobins. He had voted for the execution of Louis XVI, supported Jean-Paul Marat in his February 1793 trial, and participated in the May 31st through June 2nd mob action that forced the National Convention to expel the Girondins. Given his sterling reputation among the radical revolutionaries, he had been appointed as a representative on mission to the Bordeaux region, where he had ruled with an iron fist, combining liberal use of the guillotine with a tactic of withholding food shipments from neighborhoods that were not sufficiently revolutionary. But then, he had fallen in love with a woman named Teresa Cabarrus, the wife of an émigré nobleman, and he had spared her life and those of many of her friends. He also backed off on the executions, so much so that Robespierre recalls him to Paris in July 1794, charges him with political moderatism, and locks Teresa in prison. Teresa sends Talion a letter from prison, telling him that he is a coward if he will not defend her, and Talion becomes one of the loudest voices against Robespierre. Whether he does this for love or out of political opportunism or even just to save his own skin, well, that is up for debate. Probably all of the above. The second important representative on mission to be recalled is Joseph Fouché. Fouché is a former teacher, and had actually been teaching in Arras during the outbreak of the Revolution, where he'd become a personal friend of Robespierre. 
He'd been part of an order of priests called the Oratorians, although he himself was only in the early stages of becoming a priest and would never be ordained or take any major vows. Sensing his pro-revolutionary tendencies, the Oratorians had transferred him to Nantes, which had only made him angry and increased his support for the revolution. In 1792, he had been elected as a member of the National Convention and had initially been a member of the Girondins until he joined the Jacobin Club during the trial of Louis XVI and had been one of the loudest advocates for the king's immediate execution. Fouché was then sent back to Nantes to help deal with the Vendée Rebellion quickly guillotined any citizens suspected of royalist sympathies and was a big part of the reason Nantes never fell to the Catholic and royal army. Fouché had killed most of their would-be supporters in the city. He was then rewarded with command over the Dievre department in central France, where he became one of the most enthusiastic of the de-Christianizers, famously ordering the words, Death is an eternal sleep, to be engraved over the gates to every cemetery. After that, Fouché was transferred to Lyon. Remember the crowds of people at Lyon who were executed by being chained together and mowed down by cannons loaded with grape shot? Well, that was Fouché's idea. Robespierre had recalled him to Paris in April of 1794 because of his cruelty and his role in de-Christianization, which caused Fouché to turn against Robespierre out of pure self-preservation. In his memoirs, Fouché writes, quote, He caused me to be expelled from the Jacobins, of whom he was the high priest. This was for me equivalent to a decree of proscription. I did not trifle in contending for my head, nor in long and secret deliberations with such of my colleagues as were threatened with my own fate. I merely said to them, You are on the list. You are on the list as well as myself. I am certain of it. End quote. The last of the three representatives on mission I want to introduce is a guy who will be very important to our story going forward a fellow named Paul Barat. Now, Barat should have his picture in the dictionary next to the word corruption, but he's one of those old-school corrupt politicians who's not afraid to put his life on the line for the sake of advancement. As we'll see, he's notorious for his ill-gotten wealth, extravagant wardrobe, and gambling addiction, as well as his collection of lovers of both sexes. But Barat is no physical coward. In fact, as the son of minor nobility, he got his start in the military, serving in two expeditions to French India, during which he was shipwrecked and served in the defense of the colony of Pondicherry against the British. Paul Barat would be elected to the National Convention in 1792, and at the outbreak of the War of the First Coalition, he would be appointed as a military commissioner to help oversee the war in northern Italy. He would also be influential in retaking the rebellious Mediterranean port city of Toulon from the British, with the help of a young Napoleon Bonaparte. This meeting of Barat and Bonaparte will be very important very soon. But what Barat is most known for at the time is for becoming insanely wealthy after the fall of Toulon. As get-rich-quick schemes go, there's nothing quite like confiscating the goods and businesses of your enemies. And it's this corruption that causes Robespierre to recall Barat to Paris in early 1794. It's worth noting that Robespierre could have placated any or all of these men, simply by letting them go about their business. Talion could have gone on being merciful, Fouché could have gone on being a brute, and Barat could have gone on being a corrupt military administrator. Instead, Robespierre intends to bring them all to account, meaning he intends to guillotine them along with others. 
Say what you want about the guy, but he is strong in his principles. And when Robespierre goes, there will be few men of principle left in France. He's already killed Danton, Barnav, Brousseau, and most of the others. France will soon be left with a bunch of survivors, political cockroaches with nothing to offer to anyone but themselves. Like their animal kingdom counterparts, these political cockroaches will feast on the Republic's organic matter and turn it into fertilizer, creating the conditions for a great man with real vision to take over the whole French project. I'm talking, of course, about Napoleon, but we haven't gotten that far yet. Anyway, Robespierre comes out of seclusion on July 24, 1794, approves the new maximum wage in Paris, and meets with Jacobin Club members to call for the abolition of the Committee of General Security. He also denounces Joseph Fouché in public, saying, Tell us, Fouché, who deputed you to tell the people that there is no God? Again, we have to wonder where Robespierre's head is at. Is he truly dedicated to establishing a virtuous republic through a campaign of terror? Or is he trying to set himself up as a god king? It's open to interpretation. Robespierre's last major act comes on July 26, 1794, when he goes before the National Convention with a new conspiracy theory. He says that there is yet another foreign plot to undermine the revolutionary government, and that senior members of the National Convention are involved. It's a long speech, and I won't read all of it, but I do want to highlight a few of the things he says. He opens by praising the Convention for their patriotism, but warns that the Revolution's greatest enemies are often the loudest in praising the Revolution specifically mentioning Jacques-Pierre Brousseau and Philippe Egalité, among others. Then he tries to turn the tables on his would-be adversaries, people like Fouché who are openly accusing him of dictatorship, by accusing them of instituting the worst abuses of the reign of terror. Quote, Is it we who, seeking out ancient opinions, the fruit of the obsession with traitors, threaten the greater part of the National Convention with the blade, called in the popular societies for the heads of 600 people's representatives? It is the monsters that have accused us. Such is nevertheless the basis of these schemes for dictatorship and attacks on national liberty, imputed at first to the Committee of Public Safety in general. By what misfortune was this major accusation shifted all of a sudden onto the head of just one of its members? A strange project for one man, to persuade the convention to cut its throat in detail with its own hands, to clear his path to absolute power. Let others see the ridiculous side of these charges. I can see only their atrocity. You will give an account at least of your frightful perseverance in pursuing the plan to slaughter all the friends of the homeland. You monsters who seek to rob me of the esteem of the National Convention, the most glorious prize for the work of a mortal being, and one I neither usurped nor snatched, but had been forced to win over. To appear an object of terror in the eyes of what he reveres and loves is, for a man of feeling and probity, the most dreadful of tortures. To make him suffer it is the most heinous of crimes." but I call for your fullest indignation on the atrocious maneuvers used to shore up these extravagant calumnies. End quote. Robespierre goes on to say that slander against him is slander against the National Convention and appeals to the delegate's sense of personal honor. They have approved the actions of the Committee of Public Safety, so anyone who is opposed to the committee must actually be opposed to the convention and by extension, to the French people who elected that convention. Then he turns his focus back to the supposed foreign plotters and says that they have only marched with the revolutionaries to advance their own careers. He continues, quote, 
It does exist. That generous ambition to establish here on earth the world's first republic. That selfishness of men who are not debased, which finds a celestial delight in the calm of a clear conscience and the ravishing spectacle of public happiness. You can feel it at this moment burning in your souls. I feel it in mine. But how would our vile slanderers ever guess it? How would one born blind have the idea of light? Nature has denied them a soul. They have some right to not just doubt the immortality of the soul, but its very existence. They call me a tyrant. If I were one, they would grovel at my feet. I would stuff them with gold. I would guarantee them the right to commit any and every crime, and they would be grateful. If I were one, the kings we have vanquished, instead of denouncing me, what a tender interest they take in our liberty, they would lend me their culpable support. I would compromise with them. And their distress? What do they want if it is not the help of a faction protected by them and willing to sell them our country's glory and liberty? End quote. Robespierre now argues that it is he and his allies who have destroyed the factions in government and that they are beholden to no one except the French people whose homeland is under attack. Next, he frames the current stage of the revolution as a struggle between virtue and corruption, between honest, liberty-loving citizens and self-interested criminals. He also accuses the revolution's enemies of hypocrisy, saying that they themselves voted to eliminate both the Hebertists and the Dantonists, and that they blamed him, Robespierre, for all the executions that followed. Then he seems to predict an immediate attack on himself. Quote, I promised some time ago to leave a testament that would be redoubtable to oppressors of the people. I am going to proclaim it now with the independence appropriate to the situation I am in. I bequeath them the dreadful truth and death. End quote. Robespierre also makes a few specific accusations. One is that enemies of the revolution are being paid off by foreign powers with the support of the French financial administration, a clear attack on state treasurer Joseph Cambon, who most convention members consider a conscientious and apolitical administrator. Another of his accusations is that the military administration is failing to spread liberty to conquered territories, and is instead governing them for personal benefit, a veiled swipe at Lazare Carnot. These plotters, he says, are being supported by aristocrats, deserters from the army, enemy prisoners, and imprisoned Vendée rebels. Robespierre continues, quote, To whom should these ills be attributed? To ourselves to our lax weakness on crime and our culpable abandonment of the principles we have proclaimed. Let us not be mistaken. Establishing an immense republic on foundations of reason and equality, holding all the parts of this immense empire together with vigorous bonds, is not an enterprise that can be completed thoughtlessly. It is the masterpiece of virtue and human reason. A host of factions springs up inside a great revolution. How can they be repressed if you do not subject all the passions to constant justice? Your only guarantor of liberty is righteous observation of the principles and the universal morality you have proclaimed. If reason does not reign, then crime and ambition must reign. Without it, victory is just an instrument of ambition and a danger to liberty, a lethal pretext misused by intrigue to lull patriotism to sleep on the edge of the precipice. Without it, what is the very meaning of victory? Victory does nothing but fortify ambition, send patriotism to sleep, awaken pride, and dig with shining hands the grave of the republic. What does it matter if our armies drive before them the armed satellites of kings, 
if we retreat before the vices that destroy public liberty? What does vanquishing kings matter to us if we are vanquished by the vices that lead to tyranny? And what have we done recently against them? We have proclaimed great principles. End quote. Robespierre next makes an eerily accurate prediction. He says that if zealous revolutionaries relinquish power, that the government will first fall into factional conflict and then become a military dictatorship. He says that there will be a century of strife in France, and that the original revolutionaries will rightfully be blamed for all of it because they didn't finish the job here and now. Considering that France will spend most of the 19th century jumping from one revolution to another, this isn't far off the mark. He concludes, quote, Shall we say that all is well? Shall we continue through habit or for practicality to praise what is bad? We would ruin the homeland. Shall we expose hidden abuses? Shall we denounce traitors? They will say that we are jostling the constituted authorities, that we want to acquire personal influence at their expense. So what shall we do? Our duty. What can they hold against one who wants to speak the truth and consents to die for it? So let us say that there exists a conspiracy against public liberty, that it owes its strength to a criminal coalition that intrigues inside the convention itself, that this coalition has accomplices in the Committee of General Security and in the offices of that committee where they predominate that the enemies of the Republic set that committee up against the Committee of Public Safety, thus constituting two governments, that some members of the Committee of Public Safety are in this plot, that the coalition thus formed seeks to ruin patriots and the homeland. What is the remedy to this ill? Punish the traitors. Replace the staff of the Committee of General Security. Purge the committee itself constitute government under the supreme authority of the National Convention, which is the center and the judge, and in this way crush all the factions with the weight of national authority, to raise on their ruins the power of justice and liberty. Such are the principles. If it is impossible to pronounce them without appearing ambitious, I would conclude that principles are proscribed and that tyranny reigns among us but not that I should keep silent. For what can they hold against a man who is right and who knows how to die for his country? I was born to fight crime, not to control it. The time has not arrived for men of substance to be able to serve the homeland with impunity. Defenders of liberty will just be outlaws for as long as the horde of scoundrels predominates. End quote. At the end of Robespierre's speech, his ally, Georges Couthon, proposes a motion to publish it. These motions are normally routine for major speeches, but protests erupt in the convention chamber. Robespierre has made some damning accusations, but has refused to name names. If he's not willing to do that, then why should a speech loaded with innuendo be published for public consumption? Joseph Cambon, the Treasury Director, is particularly upset, since he has been accused of taking foreign money. Jacques-Nicolas billaud varenne one of the surviving Hebertist members of the Committee of Public Safety, also objects. After all, Robespierre has said that some members of the committee are in league with traitors, and that can only mean an attack on billaud varenne and the other surviving Hebertist committee member, Jean-Marie Collot d'Herbois. With the speech unpublished, the convention adjourns for the day, and Robespierre gives a similar speech again at the Jacobin Club that evening, except this time he openly accuses Billaud Varenne and Collot d'Herbois of treason. Both of these men are booed by the club, leave and go to the Committee of Public Safety's offices where they find Louis Saint-Just working on a speech of his own. 
he tells them both that his speech is to be their indictment, along with an indictment of the rest of the traitors. Robespierre has badly miscalculated. By naming some supposed traitors, he has created opponents who immediately begin lobbying to attack him. By refusing to name others and by saying that they come from all political persuasions, he's effectively put a target on every convention member's back. Everyone knows that they might be indicted if they don't do something about Robespierre right now. As Joseph Fouché said, You are on the list. You are on the list as well as myself. I am certain of it. The next day, July 27th, or 9 Thermidor on the Republican calendar, Saint-Just stands up to give his indictment at the National Convention. Bilod Varenne and Tallien keep raising objections to prevent him from speaking, while Collot d'Herbois, who, by the way, is currently the president of the convention, keeps deferring to their objections. A long debate ensues, with a number of delegates calling for the arrest of Robespierre and his associates. It's Alexis Vadier, the head of the Committee of General Security, who strikes the final rhetorical blow. As Robespierre keeps demanding to speak, Vadier says, quote, To hear Robespierre, he is the only defender of liberty. He is the only one with anything useful to say for his will is always done. He says, so-and-so conspires against me, I who am the best friend of the Republic. That is news. End quote. At this, there is a chorus of laughter, and Robespierre stammers at a loss for words. One delegate shouts, The blood of Danton chokes him. Robespierre counters, Danton, is it then Danton you regret? Cowards, why did you not defend him? He's right, of course, but he might as well be talking about himself. At any rate, a chorus of voices once again drowns him out, and a vote is taken to arrest Robespierre, Saint-Just, and Couthon. Robespierre's brother, Augustin Robespierre, demands to be arrested too, as does Philippe Labat, another of Robespierre's allies. The convention obliges them, and all five men are sent to separate prisons around Paris, a measure intended to prevent a jailbreak. François Henriot, the commander of the Paris National Guard who had surrounded the National Convention in 1793 and forced the expulsion of the Girondins, he is one of Robespierre's few remaining allies. When Henriot gets word of the arrest, he scrapes together 2,400 guardsmen and manages to get the five men released from prison and taken to safety at the Hotel de Ville. But the alarm bell only draws guardsmen from 13 of Paris's 48 sections. Some men are confused and demand answers from the Paris Commune, which does nothing the entire afternoon and evening. Other men, angry at the maximum wage and Robespierre's takeover of the Paris government, simply refuse to answer the call. Over the course of the evening, Henriot's guardsmen desert one by one, discouraged by the silence of the Commune and the rainy weather. At the same time, Paul Barat is raising guardsmen from the other 35 Paris sections, enough to outnumber all of them. Meanwhile, the National Convention takes an emergency vote to declare Robespierre, his brother, Saint-Just, Couthon, and Labat to be outlaws, meaning they can be executed without trial. Inside the Hotel de Ville, Robespierre writes half of a letter calling on the sans culot to come to his aid and oust his enemies in the National Convention. At some point, even he appears to give up hope, because the letter remains unfinished. 
After midnight, in the wee hours on the morning of July 28th, Bara and his men forced their way into the Hotel de Ville. There, they find Georges Couthon at the bottom of a flight of stairs. He's lying on the floor in agony, apparently having either fallen or been dumped out of his wheelchair, which sits at the top of the stairs. Upstairs, Le Bas is slumped over a table, dead. He had brought a pair of pistols into the Hotel de Ville and shot himself with one of them. He had given the other to Robespierre, but Robespierre has no experience with firearms and either out of ineptitude or indecision has only managed to blow half his jaw off. Augustin Robespierre is found shortly afterwards in an alley behind the building. He had attempted to escape through a third-story window, but had slipped on the wet ledge and fallen to the street, breaking both of his legs. St. Just is the only one of the men to remain uninjured. The surviving four men are taken into custody. Couthon and Augustin Robespierre are taken to a military hospital to have their broken bones set, but Maximilien Robespierre only has his face bandaged and is then kept at an office in the Tuileries with Saint-Just while the convention votes on their fates. Since the men have already been declared outlaws, condemning them to the guillotine is an easy decision. Along with them, 17 other men are convicted and condemned, including François Henriot, the president of the Jacobin Club, Nicolas Vivier, and Henri Simon the barely literate cobbler who had tutored young Louis the Seventeenth and given him liquor. The men are bundled onto a set of open carts and taken to the guillotine, which has been moved back to the Place de la Révolution just for the occasion. Henri Sanson awaits them, like he has awaited so many victims before. Just like those victims, Robespierre and his allies are paraded around the city, and make a few stops so people can get a look at them. In her biography of Robespierre, Fatal Purity, British author Ruth Skur writes, quote, One witness saw a woman in the crowd pull herself up on the railing of the cart to curse the incorruptible to his face. Monster spewed up from hell, the thought of your punishment intoxicates me with joy. He looked sadly at her as she added, Go now, evil one. Go down into your grave, loaded with the curses of the wives and mothers of France. The carts at last moved on. The first contained the Robespierre brothers and Henriot. Saint Just was in the second, and Couthon behind in the third. Some of the condemned had to be carried up the scaffold, but not Robespierre. He went last but one, ascending the steps on his own, a frail figure in sky blue. If he looked around when he got to the top, he would have seen the Tuileries again, from which, only six weeks before, he had emerged so proudly as the high priest of a new religion. His coat came off. Just before they strapped Robespierre to the plank, the executioner decided to rip off the bandage that was holding his face together. Perhaps the executioner, so experienced by now, thought the bandage was thick enough to get in the way of the descending blade. Perhaps he wanted to be cruel. Robespierre let out a scream. It was the deep, sharp cry of a man in excruciating pain that you hear sometimes in hospitals the violent protest of a wounded human animal that, however brave or bent on self-control, cannot stop the voice of torment. The scream was the last act of the man who had tried as no one else did to embody the revolution. It was the point of severance, when Robespierre's precious vision of a democratic republic, pure and founded on virtue, must finally have left him. End quote. According to witnesses, Robespierre continues screaming until the blade descends. For a man renowned for his intellect and eloquence, it's a pathetic end. 
and I don't know whether to feel sorry for him or to say that justice is served. Perhaps we should ask the arbiters of the revolution, the people of Paris, who cheer uninterrupted for several minutes when Robespierre's head is presented to the crowd. The day after Robespierre's execution, July 29, 1794, the National Convention purges his appointees from the Paris Commune. That day, 70 so-called Robespierrists are sent to the guillotine, bringing an official end to the reign of terror. Shortly thereafter, 73 surviving Girondins who had been expelled from the National Convention are invited back to take their seats. To many historians, this date marks not just the end of the Reign of Terror, but also the end of the French Revolution. It certainly marks the end of Simon Schama's book, Citizens, which I've used extensively and would recommend to anyone who wants to learn more on the subject. But the French Revolution is like an earthquake shaking civilization, and like an earthquake, there will be a series of aftershocks. So far, I've spent the better part of five episodes covering a five-year period. As the aftershocks get further apart, I'm going to pick up the pace. But as far as I'm concerned, there's still plenty of story to tell. The first of these aftershocks is the period immediately following the death of Robespierre, called the Thermidorian Reaction because it begins in the month of Thermidor on the Republican calendar. The Thermidorian Reaction represents yet another shift in the French Overton window, this time to the political right. Like earlier shifts to the left, not everybody in the government is doing this because they agree with new policies. Joseph Fouché and Jean Lambert Tallien, for example, were on the far left when that was popular and will now tack to the right as the political winds shift. So France is now ruled by a collection of political moderates, a few surviving influential conservatives, and political opportunists, who are collectively known as the Thermidorians. And since the only thing that unites them is opposition to the reign of terror, the Thermidorians will be a short-lived alliance. Tallien is probably the most extreme example of political opportunism. Following the fall of Robespierre, a bunch of independent newspapers pop up all over Paris, and almost all of these newspapers are politically conservative, having been suppressed during the Reign of Terror. When the Paris Jacobin Club protests at the convention, Tallien famously refers to the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which says, quote, The free communication of ideas and of opinions is one of the most precious rights of man. Any citizen may therefore speak, write, and publish freely, except what is tantamount to the abuse of this liberty in the cases determined by law. End quote. But in October, Talion supports a law banning chapters of the Jacobin Club from communicating with each other. Apparently, free speech does not apply to political organizations that have become unpopular. Not long afterwards, a mob of anti-revolutionary young men known as Muscadins surrounds the main chapter of the Paris Jacobin Club and throws rocks through the windows. Fearing for their safety, the surviving Paris Jacobins are forced to vacate their club. We'll talk more about the Muscadins in a little bit. This mob action coincides with a general purge of the Jacobin Club, conducted by the national government in November of 1794. Some former Jacobins, like Tallien and Fouché, are forgiven for their roles in the Reign of Terror and continue in government service. Others are forced out or even exiled entirely. Such is the fate of Collot d'Herbois and Bilot Varenne 
the now former members of the Committee of Public Safety, who were both exiled to Guyana in March of 1795. Collot d'Arbois dies of yellow fever not long afterwards, and Belot Varen eventually relocates to Haiti and becomes a friend of the revolutionary government there, but is never allowed to return to France. Through late summer and early fall of 1794, the National Convention has to figure out what to do with the Committees of Public Safety and General Security. On the one hand, these committees, particularly public safety, have been breeding grounds for the policies of the Reign of Terror. On the other hand, there's still a war on, and France needs a strong executive to run that war. After a series of debates that I'm not going to get into, the National Convention revokes all of the Committee of Public Safety's powers except for its original authority, overseeing the war effort. Instead, 12 new committees are established under the Convention's purview, each of which is to oversee one of the 12 government ministries. That way, no single committee or group of conspirators will be able to centralize power the way Robespierre and his allies had done. The Committee of General Security is to be one of these 12 committees, with its powers limited to running the national police force. As part of this reform, members of the committees are to be term-limited. Any given committee member can serve for four months and must step aside for a month before being re-nominated by the convention. A quarter of each committee is to be replaced each month, so there's a rotating committee membership and only a few committee members at any given time will be brand new to their jobs. In the case of the Committee of Public Safety, nobody is asked to step down for the first month. The first new appointments replace Robespierre and his friends, who have obviously left some pretty big vacancies. Out of all the members of the 12 committees, Lazare Carnot comes out best. The convention recognizes his unique talents for running the army, so he's exempted from term limits for the time being and will serve until the Committee of Public Safety is finally disbanded in the fall of 1795. At any rate, these changes represent an end to rule by committee, and return the power of French government, at least for now, to the elected representatives of the National Convention. The Thermidorian reaction also turns against the Revolutionary Tribunal. The tribunal's chief prosecutor, Antoine Fouquier Tanville, is arrested and will eventually be tried and then executed in May of 1795. Ironically, he will be the last person guillotined by the Revolutionary Tribunal. In his book, The French Revolution from 1793 to 1799, French historian Georges Lefebvre writes, quote, Finally, it was against terrorist coercion that opinion turned most violently. On the day following 9 Thermidor, the law of 22 Prairial had been repealed. The decimated revolutionary tribunal had ceased to function. Reorganized, it could not resume its bloody work because the question of intent permitted acquittals on the pretext that the accused had not been inspired by counter-revolutionary motives. The release of suspects began. And, after seven Fructidor, August 24th, following violent attacks upon them, the watch committees were reduced to one per district. Although it was still maintained in principle, the revolutionary government had lost simultaneously its three essential attributes. Its stability, its centralization, and its coercive power. End quote. The repeal of the Law of 22 Prairial results in the release of almost all the suspects who have been imprisoned during the Reign of Terror, as many as 300,000 people. Many of these people are from areas outside Paris, like Lyon and Toulon, where the Terror had been at its worst, 
and had only recently been transferred to Paris jails. After their release, the full extent and horrors of the Reign of Terror, such as the mass executions, finally become known in Paris. Remember, this is a time before electronic communication, and the press has been heavily censored for well over a year. The Committee of Public Safety had known about the horrors in Lyon and Toulon. Some members of the convention had been privy to these things. But most people in Paris had heard only rumors, if that. With the entirety of terrorist crimes now out in the open, public opinion turns decisively against former Robespierreists, which is a big reason that it's so easy for the National Convention to close the Jacobin clubs and exile or execute former members. I should point out that not all prisoners are released at the same time. It's not like France's jailers just open the doors to the prisons and let everybody out the way you see depicted in some movies. After all, the prisons also hold ordinary criminals like thieves and murderers who are going to stay locked up. Political prisoners are released individually as their cases are processed. And while the first are released on August 9, 1794, the last won't be released until December. Among these prisoners is our old friend Thomas Paine, the Anglo-American pamphleteer who had written Common Sense and Rights of Man. As a friend of the Girondins, Paine had been imprisoned under the Reign of Terror and slated for execution along with 160 of the 168 Girondin prisoners with whom he'd shared the Luxembourg prison. The jailer had gone around the prison the night before his scheduled execution, and written the names of condemned men in chalk on the outsides of their cell doors. But Payne had been receiving visitors that day, so his door was left open, and the jailer wrote his name on the inside instead of the outside. When another jailer came by the next morning to haul out the condemned, he saw no chalk mark, and Payne was spared and managed to survive until the death of Robespierre. He's released in November, returns to his seat in the National Convention with other surviving Girondins, and lives in France for another eight years before retiring to the United States in 1802. As the prisoners are being released, the government of Paris is also being reformed to prevent another popular insurrection. Instead of 48 sections, the city is now organized into 12 administrative districts called arrondissements. By the same decree passed on August 24th, each arrondissement is to have its own committee of surveillance, appointed not by the locally elected assemblies, but by the national government. The purpose of this is to prevent the local assemblies from encouraging or participating in mob action while the committees of surveillance can presumably get ahead of any would-be insurrections and arrest the leaders. Incidentally, these arrondissements still exist today as Paris's administrative districts, although the city will annex some surrounding suburbs and grow to a total of 20 arrondissements by an 1859 decree of Emperor Napoleon III. A little later, after this administrative reshuffling, in January of 1795, the National Convention allows non-juring priests to resume their duties and removes the French Catholic Church from government oversight. This puts an end to much of the royalist resistance, although as we've seen, there will still be trouble in the Vendée and a few other places. But for the most part, French conservatives exit the winter of 1794 to 1795, having gotten most of the items on their wish list. The Thermidorian reaction will continue to shape French politics through the end of October 1795. But for now, I want to turn to the war front, because the War of the First Coalition is just getting better and better for the French. And as before, a lot of this has to do not with events 
on the war front, but with things that are happening in Eastern Europe. You may remember the Battle of Valmy in 1792, an inconclusive fight between the French and the Prussians, after which the Prussian commander had been forced to turn around and defend Prussia's eastern frontier against Catherine the Great's Russian army. All of this had ended with the Second Partition of Poland, in which Prussia received a bunch of Polish land, establishing a secure peace with the Russians and allowing the Prussian army to turn back around and help their Austrian allies against the French. Well, the Russians are at it again in 1794. Not content with ruling Poland as a puppet state, Catherine the Great has demanded that the Polish army reduce its numbers from around 40,000 men to 15,000 men. This is an obvious prelude to another invasion, and will spark a widespread uprising that consumes Eastern Europe for much of the year. The fighting begins when a Polish cavalry commander refuses to disband his unit as ordered and instead advances on the Russian-held city of Krakow. The Russian garrison sallies out to defend the city, temporarily leaving Krakow's large supply depot undefended. The supply depot, in turn, is seized by a gang of Polish patriots who distribute arms and ammunition to the people, and launch a popular uprising against the Russians. This uprising, now called the Kosciuszko Uprising, is named after a Polish general named Tadeusz Kosciuszko. Astute listeners to my series on the American Revolution may remember Kosciuszko as the military engineer who designed the defenses at West Point, New York. He had since returned to Poland and won every field battle he had commanded against the Russians during the 1792 invasion. Betrayed by a Polish legislature that had been captured by the Russians, Kosciuszko had spent the last two years living in the German city of Leipzig, forming connections with a Polish émigré community that, like the French émigrés, hopes to re-establish rule over its former territory. Kosciuszko has hoped for more time to plan, but with the Russian demand to demobilize most of the Polish army and now the outbreak of a popular rebellion, the time is now or never, and he returns to Poland to take command. On April 4, 1794, Kosciuszko leads a mixed army of peasants and professional soldiers against Russian forces outside Krakow, and he defeats them. The victory sparks an even wider rebellion throughout Russian-held areas of Poland, including one in Warsaw on April 17th and another in Vilnius, modern-day Lithuania, on April 23rd. Kosciuszko takes his cues from the French Revolution. With only a small professional army to face Russia's 300,000 troops, he declares the abolition of serfdom and issues a call for mass enlistment. Polish patriots come from all over eastern Poland to join his army, many of them singing La Marseillaise. Kosciuszko's plan is to focus his efforts solely against the Russians, ignoring Prussian and Austrian-held areas of Poland for the time being in hopes of avoiding any intervention by these powers. But... Russian Empress Catherine the Great isn't called the Great for nothing, and she exploits two major weaknesses in Kosciuszko's plan. First, she gets many of the Polish nobility on her side. These guys are worried about the revolutionary tone of the Kosciuszko uprising and are especially upset about the abolition of serfdom. Most are more than happy to swear loyalty to Catherine in exchange for keeping their old feudal privileges. Second, Catherine reaches out to the Prussians and Austrians to propose another partition of Polish territory, and this quickly brings the Prussian and Austrian armies out to play. So in addition to facing 300,000 Russian troops, 
Kochusko now has to contend with roughly 200,000 troops each from Prussia and Austria. The nascent Polish Revolution stands no chance against these kinds of odds, and on October 10th, Kochusko himself is wounded and captured by the Russians near Warsaw. On November 16th, the Polish uprising is crushed for good. And just to ensure that nobody thinks of revolting again, the Russians massacre 20,000 Warsaw citizens in a single night. That's somewhere between one-half and two-thirds of the French people killed during the ten-month reign of terror. Negotiations between the Russians, Prussians, and Austrians last until October of 1795, after which Poland is divided between the three powers and ceases to exist as an independent country until 1918, when it is resurrected in the aftermath of World War I. This is a big win for the three major Eastern European powers, but it also has a big impact in Western Europe, where Prussian and Austrian troops are withdrawn from offensive operations and only defensive garrisons are left to oppose the French. The French respond by seizing the disputed territories on the west bank of the Rhine, then standing pat for the time being. This leaves France actively fighting Spain and Portugal in the south, and Britain and the Netherlands in the north. In the south, the Pyrenees Mountains provide a strong defense and form part of France's natural borders, so the Revolutionary Army is able to focus most of its efforts in the north. The winter of 1794 to 1795 is one of the coldest on record, and British and Dutch troops hunker down in their defenses, expecting to wait out the winter and hopefully get help from the Prussians and Austrians in spring, after the Kochusko uprising has been crushed. But Jean-Charles Pichigrew, the French commander in the north, has other plans. The 33-year-old Pichigrew has had a remarkable career that would not have been possible under the Ancien Regime. Born to a peasant family in eastern France, he was educated by monks and spent his early twenties teaching math at a military school. A young Napoleon Bonaparte was actually one of his first students. In 1783, Pichigrew had joined an artillery regiment where he had risen to second lieutenant, and under the Ancien Regime he would have topped out as a captain due to his peasant birth. But with the coming of the Revolution in 1789, Pichigrew would be elected as a lieutenant colonel by his own regiment. Louis Saint-Just had recognized his capabilities and in 1793 had appointed him as commander-in-chief of the Army of the Rhine, where he would play a leading role in retaking the territory of Alsace from the Prussians. In 1794, he would be reassigned to the Northern Front, where he would support operations around the Battle of Fleurus. After that battle, if you'll recall, the Austrians had withdrawn from the Netherlands. You may also recall that the Western Netherlands are strongly defended, not so much by fortifications as by their geography, with a dense network of rivers that is incredibly difficult to attack across. Well, during this unusually cold winter of 1794 to 1795, the Dutch river network freezes over, and all that land in the western Netherlands is suddenly exposed. From mid-December through late January, Pichigrew's army carries out a lightning conquest of the western Netherlands. When he arrives in Amsterdam on January 20th, Pichigrew finds that the Dutch government has already been taken over by its own group of revolutionaries, and that the stadtholder or chief administrator, William V of Orange, has already gone into exile in Great Britain. Now, 
The geography and weather explain how Pichigrou is able to take a bunch of lightly defended territory in a sort of proto-blitzkrieg. But to understand why the Dutch Republic suddenly goes revolutionary, we need to understand what's been going on there. As I've discussed in previous episodes, the Dutch have had a democratic tradition for more than a century and a half. But over that time, the House of Orange has gone from a respected series of non-hereditary elected leaders to being kings in all but name. Just a few years ago, in 1784, the Dutch had lost the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War against the British. This war had begun during the American Revolution when the Dutch had continued trading with the 13 colonies over British objections. In the aftermath, the Netherlands had been forced to submit to British demands and agree to follow Britain's rules for foreign trade, essentially putting the Dutch economy at the service of Great Britain. In 1787, Dutch patriots had tried to remove William V and hold elections, only to have the Prussian army march into the Netherlands, reinstall William, and force the Dutch legislature to declare the position of stadtholder hereditary. In other words, William V is basically a king now, and the Netherlands are basically a monarchy. This doesn't sit well with the Dutch people not just because of their own democratic traditions, but also because their monarch isn't even independent. He's a cousin of British King George III, and his wife is a part of the Prussian royal family. So the British and Prussians have been running the Netherlands as a sort of puppet state, with Dutch ports serving as little more than a conduit for British trade with mainland Europe. So while most of the people in the Austrian Netherlands, Belgium, had seen the French armies not as liberators but as invaders, many Dutch people do indeed see the French invasion as a chance to take their country back. They're only half right. While the Dutch patriots do declare a new republic, called the Batavian Republic, And while they will run their domestic affairs as they see fit, the French army under Thermidorian rule is no longer following the old revolutionary policy of spreading liberty to conquered territories. For the next 11 years, the Batavian Republic will be a French puppet state instead of a British and Prussian puppet. France is represented in the peace negotiations by none other than the Abbe C.A., the guy who had written the seminal revolutionary text, What is the Third Estate? C.A. has managed to stay alive all this time by first siding with the Girondins and then temporarily leaving the Catholic priesthood to join Hibert's cult of reason. When later asked to justify his actions during the Reign of Terror, C.A. gives an answer no one can really fault him for. He says simply, J'ai vécu, which is often translated either as I lived or I survived. Both of these translations are technically correct, but like many translations, they miss some shades of meaning. J'ai vécu is often used to refer to having lived in a city or country, something like the English words reside or abide. Had he simply meant that he stayed alive, C.A. would have said simply, Je vécu. C.A. is saying something kind of deep with this little phrase, Je vécu. He's saying not just that he stayed alive, but that he lived for a time in a version of France that was like a foreign country. Of course, my French is remedial at best, and I'm happy to be corrected if there are any French speakers out there who have a different opinion. The main takeaway is that C.A. has managed to survive the reign of terror, and he negotiates the terms of surrender for the Netherlands. 
I don't want to get into the weeds here with military history, but as regular listeners will know, I'm a bit of a military history nut, and there's one battle I absolutely have to talk about because it's cool and unique, and that is the Battle of Texel, fought on January 23, 1795, three days after the founding of the Batavian Republic. At this time, Many Dutch troops, and particularly the Dutch Navy, remain loyal to William V. Jean-Charles Pichegru dispatches a reconnaissance force under the command of a Dutch admiral named Johan William de Winter to survey the situation in the northern Netherlands, where Dutch royalists still have some control. This force arrives at a place called Den Helder on the evening of January 22nd. There... They find a squadron of 14 Dutch ships trapped in the frozen harbor. Now, French records tell of a daring cavalry charge against the Dutch Navy, but this isn't exactly what happens. The Dutch ships may be frozen in place, but the sailors are well armed, and the individual ships can still function as mini fortresses that are close enough to provide covering fire to each other. What actually happens is that the Dutch commander, Captain Hermanus Rientes, gets news of the founding of the Batavian Republic and has to decide whether to serve the new republic, scuttle his ships, or fight a battle that, even if he wins it, will probably result in his squadron becoming an auxiliary force in the service of the British Royal Navy. In other words, he's willing to negotiate. On the morning of January 23rd, De Winter dispatches a force of hussars across the ice, each man with an infantryman on the back of his horse in case fighting breaks out. The horse's hooves are wrapped in cloth to give them better footing, and the hussars surround the Dutch ships, then negotiate a surrender with Captain Rientes. Under the terms of the surrender, the fleet remains in Dutch service, but under the Batavian Republic instead of William V. So the Battle of Texel is more like an armed negotiation than an actual battle. But according to the Harper Encyclopedia of Military History, which is pretty exhaustive, it's the only time a fleet has ever surrendered to cavalry. The conquest of the Rhine territories and installation of a revolutionary government in the Netherlands secures France's northern and northeastern borders. More than that, it helps keep the French economy afloat, as the military loots the new territories. They take obvious things like food and military supplies, but also valuable artwork, and particularly in the Netherlands, the records of Swiss and Genoese bank accounts. These records give the French government access to large quantities of gold to continue funding operations. Gold that is badly needed as the paper assignat currency continues to lose value. Following the fall of the Netherlands, the British expeditionary force under the Duke of York retreats to Hanover. But in April 1795, William Pitt orders a complete withdrawal of British land forces from Europe. Without control of the Netherlands, the British have been forced to resupply their troops via the Hanoverian port of Bremen, which is too tenuous a link and risks isolating the entire army. But this is only half of the reason for the British withdrawal. They're also running short on allies. See, the French army has now achieved its operational goals. France now controls its so-called natural borders, and any further expansion of French control would be counterproductive. At best, France may take some territory that it can use to extract peace concessions. At worst, the war could take another turn and the army could start losing ground. So, in late 1794 through early 1795, French diplomats are working overtime to make peace with members of the Allied coalition. 
Ironically, negotiations are managed by the Committee of Public Safety, which in its diminished capacity still has authority over war and peace. And on February 19, 1795, the first domino falls. Despite officially being part of the Habsburg Empire, the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, which controls much of the northern part of the boot of Italy, makes peace with the French government. The National Convention ratifies the treaty, and on March 17th, grants the Committee of Public Safety the right to sign additional peace deals without the need for ratification. Prussia is the first major power to make peace. With everything going on in Poland and suspicions running high against the Russians, King Frederick William sees little point in continuing the conflict. He's also motivated by continuing rivalry with the Austrians. Remember, the Austrians and Prussians had been enemies until about five minutes before they got together in the First Coalition, and the Austrians still hoped to gain some concessions in exchange for the loss of the Austrian Netherlands. Perhaps they could even convince France to grant them a free hand in Bavaria, a southern German territory that the Prussians also want to control. If that's not enough... The Austrians have also gone behind the Prussians' backs and made a deal with the Russians to secure part of Poland for themselves. Frederick William decides that matters in Central and Eastern Europe are more concerning than the war with the French and agrees to peace on April 5th. In the agreement, Prussia and France divide Western Europe into spheres of influence with France controlling territory west of the Rhine and Prussia controlling territory east of the Rhine. Incidentally, this influences Britain's decision to pull all ground troops from the European continent. King George's territory of Hanover is east of the Rhine, meaning that if the French were to attack it, uh, they would be moving into the Prussian sphere of influence and the Prussians would theoretically defend the territory and come back into the war. The French have no territorial interests in Hanover, so the threat of Prussian intervention is enough to keep them out, and there's no need for British troops. By the same token, the Netherlands lie west of the Rhine, meaning that the British can definitely not count on Prussian help with restoring King William V as king, I mean, stadtholder. Spain is a tougher nut to crack. The Spanish war goal has changed from overthrowing the French Republican government, which now seems impossible, to carving out a southern French territory for the young Louis Charles, also known as Louis XVII, to rule. But on June 8, 1795, Louis XVII dies at the age of 10 from complications of tuberculosis. So now there is no clear claimant to the French throne. The Comte de Provence, future King Louis XVIII, and the Comte de Artois, future King Charles X, are bickering over it. Added to that, a joint Spanish-Portuguese army had suffered a major defeat in November, allowing a French army to penetrate the Pyrenees Mountains and take over the strategically important city of Miranda de Ebro. With French armies threatening the heart of Spain, no clear French king to support, and no help forthcoming from the British or the Prussians, Spain agrees to make peace on July 22nd. The French army withdraws from Spain and the pre-war border is re-established, although Spain cedes the colony of Santo Domingo, the modern-day Dominican Republic, to pay for war indemnities. Portugal and France remain at war, but the Portuguese army now has no land route to France, although their navies remain at war. This continued Portuguese involvement will become important later. On August 28, 1795, France makes peace with the Landgraviate of Hesse-Kassel, a minor power in central Germany. 
this is less important than the other peace deals, but the Landgraviate's Hessian troops are renowned for their quality, and they have served with distinction in several wars, including the American War for Independence. This peace deal takes Hessian troops out of the anti-French coalition, and peace treaties with Saxony and Hanover soon follow, leaving the revolutionary government with only two major enemies to contend with, the British at sea and the Austrians on land. While the various peace treaties are being negotiated and France keeps winning against her foreign enemies, the old domestic enemies keep rearing their ugly heads. In this case, the sans-culottes have had a rough time over the winter of 1794-1795. To begin with, the mountain's influence in the National Convention has been greatly reduced. People are now calling it the crest. The working poor now have few supporters in the government, and the assignat is continuing its freefall. Will and Ariel Durant write, quote, The producers clamored for repeal of the maximum on prices. Consumers demanded an end to the maximum on wages. The convention, now controlled by enthusiastic believers in freedom of enterprise, competition, and trade, heard the conflicting appeals and abolished the maxima, December 24, 1794. Now, the workers were free to seek higher wages, the peasants and merchants were free to charge all that the traffic would bear. Prices rose on the wings of greed. The government issued new assignats as paper money, but their value fell even more rapidly than before. A bushel of flour that had cost the Parisians two assignats in 1790 cost them 225 in 1795. A pair of shoes rose from 5 to 200. A dozen eggs from 67 to 2500. End quote. The Assignat's fall is amplified by the return of thousands of emigres, who the convention is pardoning en masse. Estates that have been used to back the new currency are now being returned to their prior owners. So, there's less and less actual value behind the collective number of assignats, even as that number of assignats in circulation continues to rise. At the same time, the military continues requisitioning goods, and the extra cold winter has frozen the rivers France relies on to turn its water mills. When spring comes, all of the snow and ice melts at once, which floods the rivers and keeps the water mills out of commission even longer. So, out of the little grain that remains for civilian use, much of it can't even be ground into flour. In the early spring, the National Convention is also conducting trials of leading terrorists. These include Jacques-Nicolas billaud varenne and Jean-Marie collot d'Herbois, whose deportations I've already discussed, along with two other men who end up escaping deportation. Combine this series of trials with the existing famine, and it's easy to understand why the lower classes in Paris might be upset. In his book, After Robespierre, the Thermidorian Reaction, French Marxist historian Albert Mathiez writes, quote, On the 12th Germinal Year 3, April 1, 1795, a crowd composed chiefly of women and residents in the working-class faubourgs invaded the convention demanding bread and the Constitution of 1793. In the end, the mob left the hall without any untoward incidents. But the disorders served the Thermidorians as a pretext for decreeing without debate, regular formalities, or inquiry the deportation of the four Decemvirs whose impeachment was impending at the very moment of the disturbance, and the arrest of sixteen Montagnard deputies, who were interned in fortresses such as the Castle of Ham. Thus, the Twelfth Germinal is a sort of reversal of May 31st, 
On May 31st, the rioters had demanded and obtained the arrest of the principal Girondin leaders. On the 12th of Germinal, it was the opposite which happened. The Rising provided the party of reaction with a pretext for ridding themselves of embarrassing political opponents by prescribing the leading Montagnards, thus violating their own law of the 8th Brumaire Year 3, which had guaranteed parliamentary immunity. There can be no doubt that it was this famine which provoked the riot on the following days. But in the petitions of the demonstrators, the complaints about food which formed their main substance were further mixed up with a whole series of political grievances. Whilst asking for bread, they at the same time wanted the Constitution put in force. That is, they desired the dissolution of the Convention, which no longer possessed their confidence, and in addition, not only the election of a new assembly, but also the restoration of election to all public bodies, including those of the sections, communes, and departments as well, together with the election of both judges and administrative officials. The Constitution of 1793. These words which they had posted up on their placards were tantamount to saying, Clear out, deputies, and your creatures with you those whom you have installed everywhere in the place of the officials we elected and who are oppressing us. They further demanded the release of the patriots imprisoned since Thermidor, the recognition of the right to hold meetings, that is, the opening of the clubs, and the punishment of Frerons jeunesse. End quote. The Freron Mathias is referring to is Louis-Marie Stanislas Freron, a friend of Paul Barat who, like Barat, had been an ally of Robespierre until it became politically inconvenient and he switched sides. Freron's jeunesse Mathias talks about are the self-proclaimed jeunesse doré, or golden youth, who are forming a new anti saint culot force within Paris. Also known as muscadins because of the musky perfume they favor, the Golden Youth are one of the more interesting subcultures I've encountered. Ian Davidson describes them as follows, quote, The Muscadins were also known as Les Incroyables, the Unbelievables. They wore their hair long, down to their shoulders, and went about in eccentric clothes. Wide-brimmed round hats, enormous cravats, velvet breeches, silk stockings, and pointed shoes. In short, their dress was intended to advertise that they were not sans culot. They were called incroyables partly because of their exaggerated dress, but partly because they adopted an affected, ostensibly upper-class form of speech, it including a pretended inability to pronounce their R's, so they were always referred to derisively as incroyables. End quote. The Golden Youth, Incroyables or Muscadins, whatever you want to call them, don't just walk around looking fancy. They also carry clubs and routinely break up meetings of sans culot by force. They form a sort of bougie street gang, and like a modern street gang, they attack people wearing the rival gang's colors. Anyone wearing long pants and a red felt Phrygian cap, the unofficial uniform of the sans culot, is a target. As the term golden youth implies, these men are almost universally young. Some of them are politically minded, the sons of aristocrats and wealthy merchants, as well as draft dodgers. But just as many of them are doing what young people often do throughout history and joining a fashionable counterculture. Starting the day after Robespierre's execution, aristocratic culture writ large has returned to Paris. And as is often the case with cultural revivals, this new culture is exaggerated. The golden youth have their female counterparts, the Marveluses, or Mewelluses, if you drop the R, 
And these ladies are every bit as outlandish, with skin-tight, almost transparent dresses becoming the norm, along with blonde wigs which had been banned during the Reign of Terror. The theater makes a big comeback, with anti robespierreist and even openly pro-royalist plays drawing huge crowds. Anyone who can afford it is hosting parties, with some of the most lavish being held by Paul Barat, who is notorious for paying prostitutes to hang out at his dinners and offer services to his guests. Anyway, in the aftermath of the April 1st protests, the Golden Youth break up a series of smaller protests before large-scale violence breaks out again. Returning to Will and Ariel Durant, quote, May 20th, a throng of women and armed men invaded the convention, crying out for bread, for the liberation of arrested radicals, and finally for the abdication of the government. One deputy was killed by a pistol shot. His severed head, raised on a pike, was presented before the convention president, Boissy Danglas, who gave it a formal salute. Then, troops and rain drove the petitioners to their homes. On May 22nd, soldiers under General Pichigru surrounded the working-class Faubourg Saint-Antoine and forced the remaining armed rebels to surrender. Eleven Montagnard deputies were arrested, charged with complicity in the uprising. Two escaped, four killed themselves. Five, dying of self-inflicted wounds, were hurried to the guillotine. A royalist deputy urged the arrest of Carnot. A voice protested, he organized our victories, and Carnot survived. End quote. This crackdown by General Pichigru and the National Convention and the series of executions that follow marks the beginning of what comes to be known as the White Terror. This new terror claims only 36 lives in the city of Paris, almost all of whom had been complicit in the original terror. But, like the original terror, most of the killing is actually done in the provinces. Groups of golden youth with names like the Company of Jesus and the Company of the Sun hunt down former terrorists and club them to death. Several cities officially arrest former Jacobins and execute them, including the cities of Lyon and Orange, and 700 people in Marseille. The largest death toll is in Toulon, where the sans culot riot and attempt to overthrow the new local government. The rioters are opposed by government troops, who slaughter them en masse. By midsummer 1795, the sans have lost the French Revolution, and decisively so. For the time being, the revolutionary government will be run by the bourgeoisie on bourgeoisie principles. These principles are reflected in France's new constitution, which is hastily put together by the now right-of-center National Convention and promulgated on August 22nd. This constitution is radically different from the Constitution of 1793, which had never been enacted and was superseded by the Committee of Public Safety's dictatorship. For one thing, there are to be strict property requirements for voters. In the first round of elections, which chooses the actual electors, only property-holding men who have paid taxes are eligible to vote. But to serve as an elector, meaning to cast a direct ballot for a member of the new legislature, a man has to have paid the equivalent of 100 to 200 days wages in taxes. The exact total depends on his district. Out of France's 28 million people, only 30,000 people, the wealthiest 0.1%, meet this requirement. At the same time, the new legislature, by law, must include at least two-thirds of the members of the National Convention. 
If at least that many aren't elected, then those who are elected will fill out their number with unelected members. This isn't just about maintaining power. It's about self-preservation, because with their actions over the last two years, with a few exceptions, the members of the convention have backed themselves into a corner. On the one hand, most of them voted to execute Louis XVI and the Girondins, which has angered the conservatives and the royalists. On the other hand, most of them also voted to execute Robespierre and his allies and suppress the Jacobin Club, which has angered the left. In both cases, they've legitimized executing people not for any actual crimes, but because those people held beliefs that were politically inconvenient. And now these political cockroaches know that their only way to survive is to ensure that they have the loudest voice in the new legislature. Like the Constitution of 1793, the Constitution of 1795 is approved by a tiny fraction of the French population. When it goes out for a national vote on September 6th, out of 5 million eligible voters, 916,334 vote yes and 41,892 vote no. I haven't seen any records of outright voter intimidation as there were in 1793, but in the aftermath of the Reign of Terror and now the White Terror, it's safe to assume that most voters are leery of voting no. If nothing else, it's telling that more than 80% of eligible voters don't even show up. On the question of re-electing two-thirds of existing delegates, the votes are even fewer and the margin much closer. 205,498 people vote yes, and 108,754 vote no. The new constitution is formally adopted on September 25th, with elections slated for October. But not everybody is happy with the new arrangements, and with the sans neutralized, the loudest opposition comes not from the left, but from the right. Remember, the young Louis XVII is dead. And while by this point the disastrous British-supported royalist invasion at Kiberon Bay has failed, there are still plenty of royalists around. For now, their support has coalesced around the Comte d'Artois, the future King Charles X, who has sponsored a small uprising of around 3,000 men out in the countryside. In and of itself, this tiny army poses no threat to Paris. But the Comte d'Artois hopes to gain the support of a popular uprising and on October 4, 1795, large groups of golden youth gather near the National Convention, along with a significant portion of the Paris National Guard. Altogether, this mob numbers 25,000 people. The terrified members of the National Convention appoint Paul Barat to organize a defense. Barat relies on a handful of regular army generals to put down the rebellion. But the decisive role is played by a 26-year-old artillery commander named Napoleon Bonaparte. We'll talk about Napoleon in a few minutes, but for now I want to focus specifically on his role in this rebellion, because outside of some military-minded folks who are aware of his role in pushing the British out of Toulon, most French people at this point have never heard of the guy. But at one in the morning on October 5th, 1795, or 13 Vendemer Year 3, Napoleon takes center stage when he agrees to take on the royalist mob on one condition, that he will have complete freedom of movement and that the convention and Barat will not second-guess his decisions. He orders one of his subordinates to go to a nearby arsenal and retrieve 40 cannons, which he positions at strategic points overlooking the royalists and blocking their path to the National Convention. Shortly after daybreak, he orders the crowd to disperse. 
they refuse. Napoleon then gives one of his most famous orders, commanding his artillerymen to fire into the crowd. They open up with grape shot, followed by fire from supporting infantry, before Napoleon orders a cavalry charge to disperse the royalists altogether. After about six hours of street fighting, over 300 royalists lie dead, and the Republican army is victorious. With his hopes for a Paris rebellion now crushed, the Comte d'Artois will remain in exile in England until his brother takes the throne in 1814. In the aftermath of the 13 Vendemer Royalist Uprising, the National Convention makes some changes. Every National Guard and Army officer in Paris is called before a tribunal and forced to account for their exact location during the uprising. Those who cannot or who supported the Royalists are arrested. The Convention then disbands the Paris National Guard and turns over control of the city to the army, with everyday policing delegated to a new professional police department. No longer will the convention risk a bunch of armed bourgeoisie men dictating the fate of France, any more than they will risk that fate being dictated by a sans mob. Incidentally, the Comte d'Artois isn't the only guy trying to take the throne. His older brother, the Comte de Provence, future King Louis XVIII, is trying to win over parts of the French army on the Austrian frontier. On October 29th, General Jean-Charles Pichegru, the recent hero of the Netherlands campaign who had put down the saint culot revolt in Paris, resigns his position and gives the Austrians the French plans of battle for besieging the city of Mainz. With these plans, the Austrian army is able to defeat the French besiegers and push the French army back to the west side of the Rhine. Pichegru's act of treason will be a closely kept secret between him, Louis XVIII, and the Austrians, for the time being. I should also point out that Napoleon never says he fired a whiff of grape shot on October 5th. That quote is taken from Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle, who famously wrote his 1837 history of the French Revolution from memory. That's pretty impressive, but writing all that from memory led to a lot of inaccuracies, which is why I haven't used Carlyle as a source. The closest semi-reliable reference to the term whiff of grape shot is Paul Barras' memoirs, where he records himself telling Napoleon to deliver a single discharge of grape fired in the air. Barras' writings are self-serving, and it's probable that he never says this either, but that Napoleon comes up with the plan on his own. With the Royalist Revolt now crushed, the National Convention is finally ready to turn over power to the new government. Elections are held on October 12th and return a total of 379 members of the National Convention to power. Unfortunately for the left, almost all of these men are conservatives, conservative sympathizers, or even outright royalists who had managed to survive the Reign of Terror. This change from the previous election is easy to understand since only wealthy people are able to vote to begin with. But it's also fair to say that even voters who sympathize with the left are sick of the revolution by now, and many have lost friends or relatives in the reign of terror. The convention briefly debates the idea of invalidating the election, but then Talion suggests taking further measures for public safety, a phrase which by now has become toxic in French politics because of its association with the reign of terror. Everybody settles down, and instead of invalidating the election, the National Convention settles on a middle course. On October 26, 1795, the convention passes a resolution giving all of its members amnesty for anything they may have done during their terms in office. 
The most charitable spin on this is that the members of the convention have learned their lesson and want to avoid repeating their pattern of purges. A less charitable interpretation is that cockroaches are gonna cockroach. Regardless of how much self-interest is involved, the amnesty is probably a good thing for the Republic if only because it theoretically instills a certain level of stability. Before we continue, I should probably talk about the new constitution a bit more, since it's the last Republican constitution France is going to have for a while. Will and Ariel Durant describe the new government well. Quote, it was composed of five bodies. First, a council of 500, les 500, empowered to propose and discuss measures, but not to make them into laws. Second, a council of 250 ancients, or elders, les anciens, who had to be married and 40 or more years old. They were authorized not to initiate legislation, but to reject or ratify into law the resolutions sent to them by the 500. These two assemblies, constituting the legislature, co-legislatif, were subject to annual replacement of a third of their membership by the vote of the electoral colleges. The executive part of the government was the directory, directoire, composed of five members, at least 40 years of age, chosen for a five-year term by the ancients from 50 names submitted by the 500. Each year, one of the directors was to be replaced by the choice of a new member. Independent of these three bodies and of each other were the judiciary and the treasury, chosen by the electoral colleges of the departments. It was a government of checks and balances, designed for the protection of the victorious bourgeoisie from an unruly populace. End quote. So the Council of 500 writes laws, the Council of Ancients approves or rejects them, and the Directory enforces laws that have been passed. Now, all the branches of government are important, but as had happened under the Committee of Public Safety, power will slowly accrue to the executive branch, which makes the Directory the most important of the three. It's so important, in fact, that Historians will often abbreviate the government of the Constitution of 1795 by calling it simply the Directory. The five initial members of the Directory are appointed as follows. The first is Paul Barat, who we've already met. He's appointed for a full five-year term, and as it turns out, that term will last longer than the Directory itself. This means he serves for the entire lifetime of the Directory and will be its most influential member. The second is Louis-Marie de Revaliere. La Revaliere is a former Girondin and anti-Catholic who reluctantly voted to execute Louis XVI only to get purged with the rest of the Girondins, then restored to the National Convention. He had joined the Committee of Public Safety after the execution of Robespierre, then serves as the first president of the Directory, and his term will last until June 18, 1799. The third member is Jean-François Roubel, an ally of Revelier, and political moderate who had served in the original Estates General spent much of the revolution as a representative on mission, and helped the Abbe C.A. to negotiate the Dutch surrender. He will serve as president starting in 1796, and his term will end on May 16, 1799. The fourth member of the directory is none other than our old friend Lazar Carnot, who continues to oversee the war effort. He's not actually the first choice for this spot on the directory. The Council of Ancients had originally nominated the Abbe C.A. for this spot, but C.A. had refused, and Carnot will remain in charge of the French armies until his term ends in September of 1797. The last director is Etienne-François Letournier, 
an ally of Carno, who is the first up for re-election and will only serve until May 20th, 1797. He is in charge of the Navy, and that's really all you need to know about him. So the directory basically has two blocks of influence. The first, Revelier and Rubel, consists of dedicated Thermidorians who are moderate liberals and want to preserve the Republican government. The other, consisting of Carnot and Le Tournier, are what we would today call technocrats. They are relatively apolitical and will accept any domestic policies that keep the nation stable and allow them to preserve the war effort. Barat, as always, is most interested in maintaining his own position and is well positioned to cast a tie-breaking vote when the other four directors disagree. In addition to remaking the French government, the National Convention had also made some changes to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. Along with a number of rights, the convention has appended a list of nine duties. Let's go over them. Quote, 1. The Declaration of Rights contains the obligations of the legislators. The maintenance of society requires that those who compose it should both know and fulfill their duties. 2. All the duties of man and citizen spring from these two principles graven by nature in every heart. Not to do to others that which you would not that they should do to you. Do continually for others the good that you wish to receive from them. 3. The obligations of each person to society consist in defending it, serving it, living in submission to the laws, and respecting those who are the agents of them. 4. No one is a good citizen unless he is a good son, good father, good brother, good friend, good husband. 5. No one is a virtuous man unless he is unreservedly and religiously an observer of the laws. 6. The one who violates the laws openly declares himself in a state of war with society. 7. The one who, without transgressing the laws, eludes them by stratagem or ingenuity, wounds the interests of all. He makes himself unworthy of their goodwill and their esteem. 8. It is upon the maintenance of property that the cultivation of the land, all the productions, all means of labor, and the whole social order rest. 9. Every citizen owes his services to the fatherland and to the maintenance of liberty, equality, and property whenever the law summons him to defend them. End quote. These nine duties all boil down to what we today would call good citizenship. Obey the law, don't participate in insurrections, take responsibility for your own family, respect other people's property, and whatever you do, don't be a draft dodger. If everybody does these things, the Republic will prosper and the army will be victorious in the field. So we have a new government, five directors, and a series of duties to go with the rights of man. Once again, we reach one of the points where many historians declare the French Revolution to be over. To be fair, we've reached the end of the period of revolutionary government and arrived at the period of a more reactionary government. But stopping here is like tuning out of a good football game at halftime. There's a whole lot of action left, and I don't want to miss any of it. The early months of the Directory are marked by a major financial crisis. Despite the assignat losing most of its original face value, the government has had little choice but to continue printing money, even though the Council of 500 knows that the currency is already all but worthless. In fact, the Directory's first tax code requires people to pay at least half of their taxes not in assignats, but in kind, 
meaning the old feudal practice of paying taxes in wheat and other commodities. The director's salaries are even listed in bushels of wheat rather than in assignats to guarantee that their salaries don't get inflated into oblivion. Nowhere is this financial pain felt more than in the countryside. In the city, rents are generally controlled, and for the time being, the working class is able to pay for housing in nearly worthless assignats. This will eventually backfire. With no meaningful income, urban property owners have no money for upkeep. Nor do they have funds for building new housing for the thousands of returning emigres who need somewhere to live. So what did these emigres do? They moved to the country, of course, where the cost of living may be higher, but at least there's housing, and people are always building more because of the lack of rent restrictions. And if you're one of those people who had purchased seized land at auction, you can make a fortune by taking advantage of the rising prices. In his book, The Thermidorians, Georges Lefebvre writes how this had worked just before the installation of the directory, and it hasn't changed much. Quote, the nouveau riche of year three provided the bourgeoisie with a strength and, as it were, a new blood, which prevented it from ossifying. It was from their ranks that, under the directory in Napoleon's rule, there came many of the leading businessmen who, pressing on with the industrial renovation begun on the English model at the end of the Ancien Regime, were the initiators of modern capitalism in France. In this respect, the Thermidorian period was no doubt simply the dawn of a new age. Nor was it unimportant for the future of the bourgeoisie that the decomposition of the rural community should speed up under the influence of revolutionary laws, and inflation contributed to this process as well. Year three was a period of triumph for the big farmers. Relieved of the maximum and of requisitioning, they sold their produce at high prices, and the country took its revenge on the town. At the same time, they paid taxes, farm rents, and the price of national property in worthless assignats. They rapidly rose above the common herd of smallholders, metayers, and day laborers to form a peasant bourgeoisie which, producing in order to sell, joined the capitalist ranks. End quote. Now, remember how I said the directory is requiring farmers to pay half their taxes in kind? Well, that is only true if they're earning a profit. Much like modern tax codes, the French directory's tax code doesn't cost you anything if you're losing money. Savvy farmers simply cook their books so they don't show a profit at the end of the year. With the national currency all but worthless, farmers also take to selling their crops on the black market for hard currency, meaning precious metal coins. By late 1795, hard currency is very hard to find in France. But if you're one of the lucky few who can sell your crops for it, again on the black market, you stand to become rich. This is especially true for those with political connections. In his book, The Last Episode of the French Revolution, being a history of Gracchus Babeuf and the Conspiracy of the Equals, 19th century British historian Ernest Belfort Bax writes, quote, Barat had acquired five estates. Merlon de Thionville possessed two chateaux and immense landed property, and could afford to give 300,000 francs a month to his mistress. Talion had made an alliance with a Spanish woman of wealth and title. Legendre, the ci devant butcher, the former friend of Danton, had come into possession of a large estate, which he kept up at vast expense. End quote. While the rich and well-connected get richer, the rural poor also suffer from massive land speculation. In February of 1796, 
the government issues a new national currency called the Mandat. While the amount of assignats in circulation have a face value of 24 billion livres, the supply of mandats is meant to top out at 800 million, with a proportional exchange rate of 30 assignats to one mandat. The government will soon renege on this and print a total of 2.5 billion livres worth of mandats, but if you have a bunch of cash on hand, when the mandat is first issued, you can make a killing. Like the assignat, the mandat is supposed to be backed by the value of seized land, with official prices set at 22 years' worth of production value per acre. In practice, due to inflation, land is actually selling for between 3 and 6 years' worth of production value depending on the location. So, smart investors exchange their worthless assignats for mandats, then buy land for a song in private sales at far less than the official land value. Anyone who is forced to sell gets their hands on a bunch of mandats, which quickly inflate into near worthlessness just like the assignats leaving the rural poor even poorer than they were before and paying rent to speculator landlords. The directory will acknowledge the mandat's failure in July of 1796 and usher in a return to hard currency. Meanwhile, in May of 1796, all this financial unrest gives rise to another coup attempt led this time not by the urban poor of Paris, but by a new agrarian communist movement. Although, again, these proto-communists don't call themselves communists because the word hasn't been invented yet. The man at the head of this movement is one of the more colorful characters of the late revolution, a guy named François-Noël Babeuf. François-Noël Babeuf was born in northern France in 1760, the son of a poor laborer who nonetheless educated him to the best of his ability. He entered an apprenticeship as a land surveyor, and by 1785, he had started working as a commissaire et terrier, a sort of specialist lawyer who advised landowners of their rights under the Ancien Régime and assisted them with things like collecting rent payments. On the one hand, he has made it clear that he hates his job and the feudal system it supports. On the other hand, his father died in 1780, so he's been supporting not only his wife and children, but also his mother and younger siblings. In other words, he needed the money. During his time as an expert on feudal law, François-Noël Babeuf joined a local literary society where people would write articles responding to social questions of the day. His first article is a detailed explanation of why the province should demolish smaller local roads and expand the larger roads instead, hardly the stuff of which revolutions are made. In fact, the article is rejected for publication, but it opens the door for Babeuf to write more and more and make friends with other educated men in the area. He would go on to write more articles about injustices in the feudal system, advocate for a single national legal code to replace the Ancien Regime's hodgepodge of local regulations, and propose a meritocracy system for army promotions instead of excluding common-born people from high-ranking positions. Babeuf's real entry into politics comes in 1789, with the calling of the Estates General and King Louis's request for the people to submit their lists of grievances for the Estates to consider. He would end up writing the list of grievances for the peasants of his own district, and as an expert on feudal rights, he would denounce the salt tax, feudal land ownership, and other elements of the old system. He would also go to Paris in time to see the storming of the Bastille and watch as some of the defenders' heads are paraded around the city. At the time, 
Babuf had written to his wife, admitting that he felt a sense of joy. Quote, How ill that joy made me. I was at the same time alike satisfied and ill-content. I said, so much the better and so much the worse. I understand that the people should do justice for itself. I approve of that justice so long as the destruction of the guilty suffices for it. But has it not today become cruel? Punishments of all kinds, quartering, torture, the wheel, the stake, the whip, the gibbet, executions everywhere have demoralized us. Our masters, instead of policing us, have made us barbarians because they are such themselves. They reap and will continue to reap what they have sown. For all this, O oh my poor wife, will have, as far as one can see, terrible consequences. We are as yet only at the beginning. End quote. Upon his return home, Babuf had gone further and helped organize a tax protest among wine sellers in his home district. An arrest warrant was issued against him, and although he would not actually be imprisoned, his political agitation caused enough of a stir among local landholders that his business dried up. So he turned to political writing instead. It was not very profitable. At one point, his wife had to pawn the family's furniture to make ends meet. This had begun an interesting period in Babuf's life, where he would become involved in local politics, say something to get himself arrested, then get released and start writing again. He became famous enough that his writings were even read in Paris. Upon his first release from prison, he would warrant a mention in Marat's newspaper. By early 1794, he had moved to Paris, where he had obtained a position in the government's Ministry of Subsistence, a position with which he could finally pay his family's bills again. During the Reign of Terror, he had curtailed his publishing activities in order to avoid any unwanted attention. But upon Robespierre's death, François-Noël Babouf began publishing a radical newspaper called the Journal of the Freedom of the Press. He spent the first few issues attacking the excesses of the Reign of Terror, but soon shifted to attacking the Thermidorian government, which once again got him in hot water with the law. He managed to escape prison by going into hiding, and it's at this point where he becomes truly famous because he rebrands his newspaper as the Tribune of the People and writes under the alias Gracchus Babuf in honor of the Gracchus brothers of ancient Rome who in their roles as Tribunes of the People had attempted to reform the Old Republic. Among other things, Gracchus Babuf argues that the perpetrators of the September massacres didn't go far enough, and that another wave of massacres will be necessary to fulfill the goals of the revolution. Among other things, he condemns the new constitution of 1795. Quote, According to this constitution, all those who have no territorial property and all those who are unable to write, that is to say, the greater part of the French nation, will no longer have the right to vote in public assemblies. The rich and the clever alone will be the nation. According to this constitution, you have two chambers, an upper and a lower, a chamber of peers and a chamber of commons. It is no longer the people who sanction the laws. It is the upper chamber that has the veto. They might as well have left it to the chamber of Louis XVI. End quote. Babouf's most recent arrest is in February of 1795, when a gang of golden youth not only attack him, but round up copies of his newspaper and burn them in public. Upon his release, Babouf again resumes publishing, but soon stops work on the Tribune of the People. Instead, in early May 1796, he writes what he calls the Manifesto of Equals. 
I won't read the whole thing because it's pretty long, but here is a relevant passage. Quote, Lawmakers, rulers, one percenters, the time has come for you to listen. Are we not all created equal? The principle remains unchallenged, for no one in full possession of his reason could seriously say that it is night when the sun is shining. Well then, we demand nothing less than our birthright, to live or die as equals. We want real equality or death. That's what we need. And we shall have that real equality, no matter the price. To hell with anyone who stands in our way. To hell with anyone who opposes an oath sworn with such force. The French Revolution is but the forerunner of another revolution. A far greater, far more decisive one. The last revolution. The people have trampled the bodies of kings and priests who had been in cahoots against them. And the new tyrants, the new stuffed shirt politicians who now sit in place of the old ones, shall meet the same fate. So what could we possibly need besides equal rights? We need equality, not only as it is written out in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, but right here among us, here under our roofs. We will do anything to win it to wipe the slate clean and pledge ourselves to equality alone. And if all art must perish for real equality to remain, so be it. Lawmakers and rulers with more money than sense, spineless fat cats, you'll not stop our good fight by simply saying that all we are doing is rehashing the demands for land reforms made in the past. You slanderers, hold your tongues now and listen in contrite silence to our demands. They are inspired by nature and rooted in justice. The land reform, the redistribution of land, was the rash claim of a few unprincipled soldiers, a few peasants moved by instinct rather than reason. What we strive for is something far higher and much fairer. The common good, the commonality of goods. No more private property. The land is nobody's property. We claim, we demand common enjoyment of the earth's abundance. That is everyone's property. End quote. There is more to the manifesto of equals, but this is the gist of it. And I want to be clear about what François Noël Bebouf is arguing for. He's not arguing for Marxism, which again hasn't been invented yet. He's not addressing the urban workers and demanding common ownership of the means of industrial production. He's calling for agrarian communism, the shared ownership of land by French peasants who will work for themselves and their families instead of paying money to landlords. Babouf's manifesto may have become just one of the many odd historical footnotes of the French Revolution if it weren't for an organization called the Society of the Pantheon. The Society of the Pantheon is the reincarnation of the old Jacobin Club under a different name, and has been officially permitted by the government in the aftermath of the royalist insurrection of 13 Vendemer. Ostensibly, this is because the old Jacobins have turned over a new leaf and are now defending the government. A whole group of them, under the name the Patriots of 89, even helped the government troops put down the royalist uprising. But the government also has ulterior motives. See, during late 1795 and early 1796, the authorities are cracking down on royalist organizations, and royalist propagandists are warning that the directory has moved to the political left. By authorizing a new leftist club, the directory now has what Ernest Belfort Bax calls a bogey to go after when the royalists start complaining. Originally called the Society of St. Genevieve, because it meets at the convent of St. Genevieve, the Society of the Pantheon relocates to, well, the Pantheon, which is where it gets its name. 
At first, it's made up almost entirely of old Jacobins and leftists. But the society is eager to grow its membership, so it establishes a rule that anyone can join if they're sponsored by two current members. This leads to massive growth, with branches of the Society of the Pantheon sprouting up all over Paris. But it also allows a number of government agents to worm their way into the club. Ernest Belfort Bax writes, quote, The policy of these government agents reached its climax in a motion proposing the sending of an obsequious address to the directory, in which the society should formally declare its adhesion to the new constitution, and the influence of the section formed within the society by them was sufficiently powerful to overcome the stormy opposition with which the motion was received by that portion of the society which remained true to the principles on which it had been founded, and to get the motion of subservience carried. The tactics of the government and their dealings with the Pantheonists were distinctly clever, since it made evident an unmistakable cleavage in their body, which showed plainly who were those constituting the irreconcilable section and who were their leaders. The latter seemed to have regained their ascendancy in the society, and also in the branches scattered over Paris. End quote. The government may have divided the society of the Pantheon and identified the left-leaning leadership, but what they don't count on is François-Noël Babeuf, who joins the society in early 1796 and brings along a number of his followers. At this point, Babeuf is still pushing for reform by political means. He's not an insurrectionist, not because he's against insurrection per se, but because he believes that the majority of the people are tired of violence and would be opposed to another violent revolution. By March, Bebouf has changed his mind. The fiscal crisis, food crisis, and housing crisis have all made life harder on the common people, and he believes that the time is ripe for a little more revolution. He and some friends establish a new, secret, insurrectionary committee within the Society of the Pantheon. Among these friends is an Italian utopian socialist named Philippe Buonarotti, who survives the whole conspiracy and becomes one of the forerunners of Italian revolutionary thought. Buonarotti is also the main reason we know so much about Bebouf's little insurrection, because He's on the inside of it, and he'll write about it in the 1800s. The new insurrectionary committee sends out feelers to other branches of the Society of the Pantheon, and within a few weeks, each of the club's branches has its own committee, reporting to Babeuf. The conspirators also recruit some influential former members of the Mountain who have lost their elections for the new National Assembly and are also interested in launching a new revolution. But with the rise of the Golden Youth, decline of the sans culottes and a large military presence in Paris, a popular insurrection would be doomed to failure. Any successful uprising will require assistance from the military and the new police force. So the conspirators reach out to local military garrisons and police stations to try and gain support. This is impossible to do in secret, and the planned uprising becomes common knowledge. Paul Barat even offers to help, provided he's given enough bribe money, and this is the main obstacle the conspirators face. They simply don't have the funding to bribe enough people to help. Army officers want money, and without bribes, they're content to continue working for the government and collecting their salaries. Besides which, Lazar Carnot and the technocrats, along with conservative members of the new government, are understandably opposed to any leftist uprising and demanding that the rest of the government and the directory do something about it. But the Paris police are more receptive to insurrectionary ideas, and by the end of April 1796, the conspiracy of the equals has gained the allegiance of thousands of people. 
It's in this environment that Babouf goes to a meeting of the Society of the Pantheon, reads his manifesto of the equals aloud, and receives a round of applause. Many former Jacobins join the conspiracy, which comes to be known as the Conspiracy of the Equals. It's too late. In his book, The Directory, Georges Lefebvre writes, quote, They had delayed too long. The police legion was dissolved on 11 Florial without any serious incidents. They had been betrayed, too. Grizel, one of the military agents, had sold his friends to Carnot. Babouf was arrested on the 21st, May 10th, as were Brennerati and Drouet. All the committee's papers fell into the hands of the police, and the directory issued 245 warrants for the arrest of the persons who were mentioned in those papers, often unknown to themselves. Although there had been no disturbance of the peace, the country's rulers were still in the grip of fear, and by railing against their prisoners, with the help of the papers, they terrified the bourgeoisie. All the more so that in Prairial, the monetary and economic crisis roused the workers once again. The directory obtained authority to call up another 10,000 men. End quote. The directory dithers for a while about what to do with the conspirators. Some, like Barras, support clemency. But by now, Carnot and the technocrats are dominating the government, and the conspirators' trial finally begins in February of 1797. It drags on for three months, but the leaders are finally condemned to death. Babouf tries to kill himself with a knife before his execution, but he fails, and after being quickly bandaged up, he's guillotined on May 27th. This abrupt end to the conspiracy of the equals occurs at the same time as a revival of the White Terror. The Society of the Pantheon is ordered to disband, much like the Jacobin Club had been. The most radical former members are arrested, and a number of local elections, which had resulted in wins for the left, are nullified. In Marseilles, for example, the elected city council is disbanded and replaced by men who have been hand-picked by the directory. So much for yet another round of popular uprisings. Now, I've already gotten into the year 1797, but I want to rewind a little bit to August of 1796 to talk about the military and foreign policy aspects of the French Revolution. And that's mostly what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this episode, because as every other part of the government becomes weaker, less effective, and less relevant, the military keeps getting stronger, as does France's foreign policy position. Now, the most important outcome of this trend is the rise of Napoleon, which I promise you I'm about to get into. The man from Corsica is going to dominate the end of this episode and all of the next. But first, I want to touch on two other things that would be easy to miss if we went straight to Napoleon. The first thing I want to touch on is the Second Treaty of San Ildefonso signed on August 19, 1796. This is a military alliance between France and Spain, which represents something of a return to the pre-revolution status quo since France and Spain have been allied for a while before the French went all revolutionary and executed their king. So, now the French have their first major European ally not counting the Batavian Republic, which is more of a puppet-slash-client state. Spain allies with France out of pure self-interest. The main Spanish rival at this time is Britain, not France. Britain has the world's most powerful navy, as well as a colonial empire that's beginning to rival the Spanish Empire. By allying with France the Spanish hoped to cut the Royal Navy down to size and maybe even seize some of that sweet British colonial land for themselves. 
They'll be at war with Britain until 1808, with the exception of a two-year ceasefire from 1802 to 1804. All of this happens in the context of ongoing Franco-British hostilities, so we'll talk about individual events when they become relevant. The other event I want to touch on is Talleyrand's return from his exile. Just as a refresher, Talleyrand is a bishop who's more interested in politics than church affairs. He had served as a deputy to the Estates General from the First Estate and had been one of the loudest voices promoting the creation of the Assignat and the seizure of church property. He had been one of the leaders in the revolutionary government before documents discovered during the Armoire de Fer incident had revealed secret backroom dealings between him and King Louis and he had run away to exile. Talleyrand had stayed in England for a while before going to the United States, earning money in business in Philadelphia, and becoming friends with Alexander Hamilton. Now that the French Overton window has moved back from the far left, Talleyrand manages to get his name cleared by the directory, and returns to France on September 25, 1796. He will soon reinvent himself as an expert on commerce and foreign affairs and will become foreign minister on July 15, 1797, a post he will hold for the next 10 years with only a brief interruption in 1799. He'll play a big role in Napoleon's rise to power and also in European affairs more generally. So it's worth remembering that Talleyrand is back. And now is the moment you've probably been waiting for. The moment when a guy named Napoleon Bonaparte starts to gain influence in French government. I've already mentioned him a few times in this series because he's been around for a while. But since Napoleon will be our most important character going forward, it's worth looking at him in a little more detail. Napoleon Bonaparte is born in Corsica in 1769, and appropriately he's born right at the end of a war. But in this case, it's a war against the French. Corsica is a small island in the western Mediterranean, just north of Sardinia and south of the city of Genoa, which is in the northwest of modern-day Italy on the Mediterranean coast. Corsica had actually been a part of the Republic of Genoa until it declared independence and had its own revolution before the French, or for that matter, the Americans, way back in 1755. The Republic of Corsica is small, but it's able to deter Genoese reconquest. That is, until Genoa sells the island to France in 1768, in exchange for France for giving some sovereign debt. Now, France doesn't really care about Corsica one way or the other, but they purchase it to make sure that the British Empire doesn't decide to take it for themselves and turn it into a military base in any purely hypothetical future war against Great Britain. The Corsican Republic is never consulted on this horse trade. France takes the island against fierce resistance and only finally puts down the Corsican Patriot Movement on May 9th, about three months before Napoleon's birth on August 15th. Napoleon's actual name is Napoleone de Buonaparte, and his parents are minor Italian nobility who had supported the Corsican Republican government. He's the fourth of 14 children, and the second of eight who will survive to adulthood. Napoleon's father, Carlo Bonaparte, is an ambitious man, and has begun working as an attorney for the French by the time our future emperor is born. By the time Napoleon is eight years old in 1777, Carlo has become the official representative of Corsica in King Louis's court at Versailles. 
Napoleon is sent to the French mainland, where he first attends a religious school, then goes on to military school at the age of 10 in 1779. Times aren't easy for the young Napoleon. He's technically of the nobility, but just barely. Not only are his parents minor nobles, but he's from this island that most French aristocrats see as a backwater full of hicks, and they never stop reminding him about it. And while he quickly becomes fluent in French, he will always speak with a strong Corsican accent, and Corsican and Italian will always be his first and second languages. Never popular with his fellow students, Napoleon nonetheless excels at school, where he earns his highest marks in history and also does very well in math, a subject that will serve him well in coming years. He does less well at spelling, never fully mastering French and reverting to Italian spelling even for everyday words. This will serve historians well, since Napoleon is a prolific writer of letters and memoirs, and historians can tell whether a piece was dictated or written by the man himself based on the spelling. If it's written in proper French, it was dictated. If the spelling is Italian, we're looking at something from Napoleon's own hand. At the age of 15, Napoleon graduates, then attends the École Militaire, a military academy in Paris that Louis XVI's grandfather, Louis XV, had established to educate poor noblemen as officers. On February 24, 1785, Carlo dies of stomach cancer at only 38 years of age, and after his debts are paid, there's not a penny left for young Napoleon. The École Militaire is cheap, but it isn't free. Without any money for the next year's tuition, Napoleon works overtime to complete the two-year artillery program in a single year. He scores exceptionally well in geography as well as, once again, in history and mathematics, and he applies his math skills well. He's so good at sighting in guns and calculating trajectories that some of his instructors recommend him for the Navy before he's appointed as a second lieutenant in a garrison regiment in France. And there he might have stayed if it hadn't been for a little thing called the French Revolution. See, when the French Revolution breaks out, revolutionary authorities are worried that Britain is about to make a move for Corsica. Britain has allowed former Corsican Republican leader Pasquale Paoli to leave exile in England, and naturally enough, he goes to Corsica to set up a nationalist movement. Napoleon travels there to offer his services to the nationalists, and get this, Paoli refuses him on the grounds that he's unreliable. Paoli and Carlo Buonaparte had been friends and he feels that Carlo had betrayed him. But that's okay. Napoleon instead runs for election in a local French Republican Army regiment, makes some deals to get his rivals for election imprisoned on election day, and wins. War does indeed break out in Corsica, and British forces land and fight alongside Paoli's Corsican Nationalist Army to drive out the French. The French army will make a comeback in 1796 when Spain enters the war on France's side and changes the naval balance of power in the Mediterranean, which forces the British to withdraw their support from Pasquale Paoli. But for the meantime, in 1793, Napoleon returns to Toulon on the mainland to escape possible reprisals from the new Anglo-Corsican government. It's worth noting that Napoleon's older brother Joseph and younger brother Lucien had been vocal supporters of the Republican cause, so when Napoleon leaves for the mainland, so does the rest of his family. When Toulon goes over to the British side in June of 1793, the Buonaparte family relocates again, 
this time to nearby Marseille. And by the way, this is when Napoleon and the rest of the Buenapartes drop the Italian pronunciation and start going as Bonaparte. While the Corsican campaign had been a failure for France, Napoleon himself had gained valuable experience and advanced to lieutenant colonel. In the process, he had also become an advocate of the French Republican cause. Meanwhile, the future emperor had been writing during this time, and some of his pro-Republican writings had gotten the attention of Augustin Robespierre. The younger Robespierre brother manages to get him a position as an artillery commander in the Siege of Toulon, where his plan to take over an elevated British artillery position allows the French artillerists to threaten British ships in the harbor and force them out. Napoleon is on the map. He's making a name for himself. Unfortunately for him, and for many other people, The Thermidorian reaction comes for everybody associated with the Robespierre brothers, and he ends up getting arrested, released, then recalled to Paris, where he's briefly removed from the army roles because he refuses to take up a position in the Vendée. There, in Paris, Napoleon is still spinning his wheels when fate intervenes again the 13 Vendemer uprising happens, and he lays into the mob with grape shot. And I want to paint a picture of Napoleon during this time. When you picture Napoleon Bonaparte, you may picture a short, paunchy, balding, middle-aged guy. And that's not at all what Napoleon looks like during the events of 13 Vendemer. To begin with, he's never short per se. At five foot seven, he would be on the short side today, but he's the average height of a European man in the late 18th century. As I've said before, people are shorter back then. Six foot two is like enormously tall. 26 year old Napoleon is average height, but he does have a slim frame. He was sick a lot as a kid, and having grown up without a lot of money is known to have skipped meals in order to buy books. He never wears a powdered wig like most aristocrats, instead growing his own dark hair down to his shoulders. Napoleon is a high-energy guy who likes to be on the front lines leading his men in person, and by sort of modeling this gung-ho, high-energy attitude, he's a great motivator. As we'll see, this high-energy approach to life extends not just to his leadership style, but also to his tactics and strategy. Napoleon is also known for promoting the same group of guys along with him as he moves up the ladder. The young officer he sends to collect cannons on 13 Vendemer is a good example. That guy is a second lieutenant named Joachim Murat, and Murat skillfully brings the cannons into the heart of Paris while avoiding the royalist mob. By the end of Napoleon's reign as emperor, this guy, Joachim Murat, will have married Napoleon's sister and moved all the way up to become king of Naples. Not too shabby for a second lieutenant. Napoleon is like a football coach who builds a team of assistants and works with them again and again. As we discussed... Paul Barat had called Napoleon into service on 13 Vendemer, and he'd done this because of Napoleon's reputation from Toulon, but it was a gamble. Following the battle, Ian Davidson writes, quote, Bonaparte was well rewarded by Barat. Three days after helping to suppress the insurrection of Vendemer, he was promoted to deputy commander of the Armée de l'Intérieur. Eight days later, he was promoted from brigadier to lieutenant general. And ten days after that, 
On October 26, 1795, he was the commander-in-chief of the Army de l'Interior. The next spring, on March 9, 1796, he married Josephine de Beauharnais, and two days later, he left Paris for Italy at the head of the Armée de l'Italie, with which he was to make a fortune for the army, for France, and for himself, and a reputation as the country's principal military hero. End quote. Now, the campaign for Italy is a big deal, and we're about to get to it. But first I want to talk a little bit about Napoleon's relationship with Josephine de Beauharnais. Josephine is a widow, six years older than Napoleon, with two children, a son and a daughter from her first marriage. Her husband, a wealthy nobleman named Alexandre de Beauharnais, is one of the military commanders at Mainz, a city the French had taken from the Austrians only to lose it back again. Like many other failed French commanders, particularly aristocrats, Alexandre de Beauharnais is accused of cowardice and executed in 1793. Josephine herself is arrested in 1794 under the law of suspects and would likely have been guillotined too if not for the end of the Reign of Terror. As it stands, she is released from prison on July 28, 1794 the day after the death of Robespierre. Josephine becomes a merveilleuse, one of those scantily clad party girls I talked about who become so popular during the Thermidorian reaction. She's renowned for her wit, personality, and beauty, and soon becomes one of Paul Barras's many mistresses. Following 13 Vendemer, Barat decides that Napoleon needs a proper aristocratic wife and introduces him to Josephine. The two get along well and are soon married. This idea of a young, up-and-coming officer marrying an older woman is not unique to Napoleon and Josephine. Between the war and the reign of terror, France is full of widows many of whom, like Josephine, can bring fortunes from their first marriage to their second marriage and help a young officer's career. It's clear from the beginning that Josephine sees her marriage with Napoleon as one of convenience. He brings his military career and growing political clout. She brings money. For Napoleon, the marriage seems to be one of genuine love and affection. Shortly after departing for Italy, he writes her, quote, Nice, 31 March, 1796. Not a day passes without my loving you. Not a night but I hold you in my arms. I cannot drink a cup of tea without cursing the martial ambition that separates me from the soul of my life. Whether I'm buried in business or leading my troops or inspecting the camps, my adorable Josephine fills my mind. My soul is sad, my heart is in chains, and I imagine things that terrify me. You do not love me as you did. You will console yourself elsewhere. Goodbye, my wife, my tormentor, my happiness, whom I love, whom I fear, the source of feelings that make me as gentle as nature herself, and of impulses under which I am as catastrophic as a thunderbolt. I do not ask you to love me forever or to be faithful to me, but simply to tell me the truth. Nature has made my soul resolute and strong, while yours she is constructed of lace and gauze. My mind is intent on vast plans, my heart utterly engrossed with you. Goodbye. If you love me less, it must be that you never loved me at all. Then were I indeed to be pitied. Bonaparte. End quote. Throughout his campaign in Italy, Napoleon is constantly writing to Josephine, urging her to come join him. Here's just one example. Quote, Castiglione, July 22, 1796. The needs of the army require my presence hereabouts. It is impossible that I can leave it to come to Milan. 
Five or six days would be necessary, and during that time movements may occur whereby my presence here would be imperative. You assure me your health is good. I beg you, therefore, to come to Brescia. Even now I am sending Murat to prepare apartments for you there in the town, as you desire. I think you will do well to spend the first night, July 24th, at Cassano, setting out very late from Milan, and to arrive at Brescia on July 25th, where the most affectionate of lovers awaits you. I am disconsolate that you can believe, dear, that my heart can reveal itself to others as to you. It belongs to you by right of conquest, and that conquest will be durable and forever. I do not know why you speak of Madame T., with whom I do not concern myself in the slightest, nor with the women of Brescia. As to the letters, which you are vexed at my opening, this shall be the last. Your letter had not come. Adieu, ma tendre me. Send me news often. Come forthwith and join me, and be happy at ease. All goes well, and my heart is yours for life. Be sure to return to the adjutant general Miolis the box of medals that he writes me he has sent you. Men have such false tongues, and are so wicked, that it is necessary to have everything exactly on the square. Good health, love, and a prompt arrival at Brescia. I have at Milan a carriage suitable alike for town or country. You can make use of it for the journey. Bring your plate with you, and some of the things you absolutely require. Travel by easy stages and in cool weather so as not to tire yourself. Troops only take three days coming to Brescia. Traveling post, it is only a 14 hours journey. I request you to sleep on the 24th at Cassano. I shall come to meet you on the 25th at latest. Adieu, my own Josephine. A thousand loving kisses. Bonaparte. End quote. But Josephine never comes and in her letters to Napoleon, she refers to him using the formal pronoun vu instead of the more familiar tu, which would be expected between a wife and her husband. As it turns out, she's already cheating on Napoleon with another young army officer named Hippolyte Charles. Napoleon will learn of the affair and forgive her, but will end up taking a mistress of his own a year later during the invasion of Egypt, while Josephine resumes her affair with Charles. Upon his return to France, Napoleon will throw her out of the house, but she will send her two children to beg him to take her back, and he will agree, saying in his memoirs that even though he feels nothing for Josephine anymore, he's come to love his stepchildren, and is willing to keep the marriage together for their sake. By this point, Napoleon is not yet emperor, but is a very powerful man, and the power dynamic in the marriage shifts. For the rest of their marriage, Josephine comes with Napoleon on several campaigns and seems to love and respect him, while he continues to take a series of mistresses. In a word, their relationship is complicated, but that's all in the future. For now, in late 1796, young Napoleon is hopelessly in love and is on his way to Italy. You may remember how General Jean-Charles Pichegru had given French plans to the Austrians and the Republican army had failed to take the city of Mainz in the fall of 1795. Well, it's now the spring of 1796. Things have stayed pretty much the same on the Rhine frontier, and the French are once again going to go on the offensive and try to capture Mainz. French generals Jean Jourdain and Jean Moreau are about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Archduke Charles of Austria. Archduke Charles is the brother of Holy Roman Emperor Francis II, as well as of Marie Antoinette, and will go on to become one of the few men to ever defeat Napoleon in battle. But for now, Napoleon is not going to be fighting against him. While Lazar Carnot doesn't really want to give the young Corsican general a major command, Paul Barat keeps bugging him, 
so Carnot agrees to put Napoleon in charge of the Army of Italy. For Napoleon, this is a backhanded compliment. The Army of Italy is where French officers' careers go to die. The fighting has been stalled for three years in the Alps, where Austria and their small Italian allies are holding the line against French troops. For both sides, Italy is a secondary front, because the Alps make such a good defensive line. North of Italy, Switzerland sits between the two war fronts, doing its whole heavily armed neutrality thing. And the real fighting is on the other front, the Rhine front. That's why the Austrians have put their top general, Archduke Charles, up there. And it's why Lazar Carnot sticks Napoleon in Italy, not Germany. He's not expected to succeed. Will and Ariel Durant write of Napoleon, quote, Reaching Nice on March 27th, he found the Army of Italy in no condition to face the Austrian and Sardinian forces that blocked the narrow entrance into Italy between the Mediterranean and the Towering Alps. His troops numbered some 43,000, brave men accustomed to mountain war but ill-clothed, ill-shod, and so poorly fed that they had to steal in order to live. Hardly 30,000 of them could be called upon for arduous campaigns. They had scant cavalry and almost no artillery. The generals over whom the 27-year-old commander had been placed, Augereau, Messina, La Harpe, and Cesurier, were all older than Napoleon in service. They resented his appointment and were resolved to make him feel their superior experience. But at their first meeting with him, they were awed into quick obedience by the confident clarity with which he explained his plans and gave his orders. End quote. Napoleon's men are in such bad shape, mostly because of the French economic situation and the war policy. Because of the fiscal crisis, the government is unable to supply its troops properly or pay them on time. Instead, the armies are supposed to live off the land, which presents somewhat of a paradox. Troops that are advancing can live off the land by pillaging the enemy. But troops on the defensive are literally starving. In his book, Napoleon, A Political Life, Historian Stephen England writes, quote, All armies, and not just the French, were badly off at this time and complaining constantly. Bonaparte did what he could to improve his men's outfitting. The army's commissioners, purveyors, had probably never seen their lives so plagued by the demands and criticisms stemming from a commander-in-chief. Nevertheless, weeks into the campaign, the troops were still wearing threadbare uniforms, if uniforms at all, and had no baggage trains because there was no baggage, a condition that arguably improved their mobility, however. Rarely have appearances so stood at odds with reality, for if the Republic's soldiers looked like the dregs of humanity, they fought like Caesar's legions in Gaul. One did not join the armed forces expecting to be well provided for, but because the alternative in the village or the urban gutter was worse. End quote. Napoleon goes on the offensive in the spring of 1796, and his Italian campaign is famous for its audacity. He faces three enemy armies, one Austrian army at Genoa, another further west along the coast, and the army of Sardinia and Piedmont further north. Altogether, the three allied armies outnumber him two to one, but individually his army outnumbers each one of theirs. So Napoleon will use a strategy he uses again and again throughout his career. Strike the enemy armies one at a time as quickly as possible and defeat them one by one before they can link up. After sneaking his men into northern Italy via an alpine pass, 
Napoleon attacks the westernmost Austrian army first, forces them to retreat, then moves north against the king of Sardinia, Piedmont, and thereby positions his army between the Sardinians and Austrians, which prevents them from linking up. He then attacks the Sardinian forces again and again, winning five small battles over the course of two weeks. The king of Sardinia, Piedmont, is desperate to maintain any kind of power in his small kingdom, so he officially cedes the territories of Nice and Savoy to France. Those are the parts of modern-day France that are on the western side of the Alps that the French had already controlled. But no longer are these territories under French occupation. They are now legal French territory, which they have remained through to the 21st century. Not only has Napoleon knocked Sardinia Piedmont out of the war, he has officially achieved in two weeks what his predecessors have failed to achieve in three years. Still, Napoleon does not allow a disorderly pillage of this wealthy Italian territory. Instead, he installs his own administrators in conquered towns and collects taxes for his armies, extracting most of the money from the nobility. He insists on good order, writing in a public letter to his troops, quote, Soldiers, you have in a fortnight won six victories, taken 21 standards, 55 pieces of artillery, and conquered the richest part of Piedmont. Without any resources, you have supplied all that was necessary. You have won battles without cannon, passed rivers without bridges, made forced marches without shoes, camped without brandy and often without bread. Your grateful country will owe its prosperity to you. But soldiers, you have done nothing as yet compared with what there still remains to do. Neither Turin nor Milan remains to you. Is there anyone among you whose courage is lacking? Is there anyone who would prefer to return across the summits of the Apennines and the Alps and bear patiently the disgrace of a slavish soldier? No, there is none such among the conquerors of Montenot, of Dago, of Mondovi. All of you are burning to extend the glory of the French people. Friends, I am promising you this conquest but there is one condition which you must swear to fulfill. That is to respect the peoples whom you deliver and repress the horrible pillage which certain scoundrels incited by our enemies commit. Otherwise, you will not be the deliverers of the people, but their scourges. Your victories, your bravery, your success, the blood of your brothers who have died in battle, all will be lost, even honor and glory." As for me and the generals who have your confidence, we should blush to command an army without discipline and restraint. Anyone who engages in pillage will be shot without mercy. Peoples of Italy, the French army comes to break your chains. The French people is the friend of all peoples. You may receive them with confidence. Your property, your religion, and your customs will be respected. We have no grudge except against the tyrants who oppress you. End quote. Now, Napoleon is just getting started. But as he is continuing to defeat one Austrian army after another in the south, the French army is having all kinds of trouble up north along the Rhine front. Generals Jourdan and Moreau advance into Germany in parallel, with Jourdan advancing to the north of Mainz and Moreau advancing around the south. The goal is to envelop the city by threatening the Austrians in two places and forcing them to divide their army. But Archduke Charles doesn't engage. He just retreats further into Germany and allows Jordan and Moreau to chase him east, all the while letting their armies drift further apart from each other. Then, 
when they have gotten far enough apart that they cannot support each other, Charles defeats Jordan and Moreau in separate battles. He kind of pulls a Napoleon here, and he drives the French army all the way back to the Rhine. So this big offensive in Germany that Lazar Carnot has been sending most of his troops to has failed. And instead, here's Napoleon tearing it up in northern Italy and threatening Austria from the south. The Austrians don't need to feel too bad about this. Depending on how you count what's a battle and what's a skirmish, Napoleon will command in between 60 and 80 battles during his career, and he will win all but seven of them. Incidentally, that's why I won't be talking in detail about all his battles, because even if I gave each battle a mere two minutes, just giving brief snippet-sized descriptions of each battle would take more than two hours. But I do want to talk about one of his signature victories, and that's the Battle of Rivoli. Following the surrender of Piedmont Sardinia in April of 1796, Napoleon attacks the Austrians again in May. By this time, the main Austrian army has withdrawn north of the River Po and has taken a defensive position in preparation for an expected French attack. But Napoleon does not attack them directly. He marches his army past the Austrians to the east along the southern bank of the Po, all the way down river to the next crossing, which is 50 miles into the Austrian supply lines. With their supplies cut off, the Austrian army is forced to retreat again, and Napoleon's army marches into the city of Milan on May 15th. To advance further, the French will need to take the well-supplied fortress city of Mantua. In the meantime, as he's setting up this attack on Mantua, Napoleon's army gets strung out along a defensive front between Austria and that city. At any given point along this defensive front, a large Austrian attack could break through the spread out French forces. They could cut Napoleon's smaller army in half and lift the siege of Mantua and Furthermore, force Napoleon to withdraw back to the west. The siege of Mantua goes on for months, until January 1797, when Austrian general Joseph Alvinci attacks the French lines and splits his own army in two, one under his own command and another under the command of a subordinate named Johann Provera. Napoleon isn't going to wait for both Austrian armies to get to Mantua. He's going to do his Napoleon thing and attack both enemy armies in turn, starting with the 28,000-man force Alvinci is personally commanding. With only 23,000 men, Napoleon occupies a hill town called Rivoli, which sits right in the Austrians' path. His right flank is anchored on the Adige River, where his men are occupying a canyon that runs north to south along the riverbank. Alvinci is going to have to attack across an open plain that exposes his men to a lot of artillery and musket fire. Or he's going to have to send some guys way around the French flank to the west, or he's going to have to attack through the canyon. Since he has superior numbers, he decides to do all three. Napoleon suspects that Alvinci is going to try and surround him, so he attacks first in the early morning hours of January 14th, sending his men down from the hilltops to battle the Austrians on the plain in the center. At first, the French aggression seems to pay off, but the superior Austrian numbers eventually force Napoleon's men back up the hill, where they're only able to avoid collapse by occupying a church and using it as a sort of mini-fort. 
with the French line on the top of the hill now holding, barely, Napoleon turns his attention to the east end of his line, where his men are being pushed back through the canyon by a sustained Austrian attack. He pulls some artillery from the top of the hill, which again is already barely holding, and redeploys the cannons to the canyon. His men load up with grape shot, and the Austrians soon fall back under the withering fire and a charge by a mere 26 French cavalrymen. To the west, a group of Austrian cavalry is looping around the French lines and preparing to attack up the back of the hill. So Napoleon pulls his only reserves and sends them out to fight the Austrians. His men fight the Austrian cavalry to a standstill, until more French reserves arriving from the rear show up and surround the Austrian flanking force and capture 4,000 men. With the momentum shifting, Napoleon orders his men in the canyon to attack up onto the central plain where the Austrians are attacking from. With all of his reserves already committed, General Alvinci has nothing to beat back the French assault on his flank, and his army is forced into a disordered retreat, badly mauled. Napoleon sends half his army under the command of General Barthélemy Joubert to pursue Alvinci, which he does for a day and a half, killing or more often capturing retreating clusters of Austrian soldiers, and by the end of January 15th, Alvinci is returning unopposed back to Austria with only half of his 28,000-man force remaining. The other wing of the Austrian army, the one commanded by Johann Provera, gets close enough to Mantua to start exchanging messages with the besieged garrison and planning a relief of the city. But Napoleon has led his men on a forced march south from Rivoli, linked up with another one of his subordinates who has been tracking Provera all this time and has managed to surround the Austrians. Deep in enemy territory, surrounded, and with no hope for help anytime soon, Provera surrenders with his 7,000 men. The city of Mantua, now with no hope of relief itself, surrenders to Napoleon on February 2nd. In his book, 100 Decisive Battles from Ancient Times to the Present, American historian Paul K. Davis writes of the Battle of Rivoli's significance. Quote, After a string of defeats in northern Italy, the Austrian army was in bad shape. Napoleon gave them no rest, and was preparing an offensive towards Vienna for the spring. Striking before the Austrians did, French forces drove Austrian troops out of the Tyrolean mountains in March and captured the important arsenal at Trieste on 18 April. The Austrian government finally realized their predicament and opened negotiations with France, leading to the signing of the Peace of Campo Formio on 17 October 1797. Napoleon's campaign not only won for France a victory over one of Europe's premier nations, it gave France control of northern Italy. Napoleon, when not fighting the Austrians, was reorganizing the political structure of the North Italian provinces, and his combination of Milan, Bologna, and Medina into the new Cisalpine Republic was confirmed by the peace treaty. This brought to Italy for the first time the principles of the French Revolution, marking the first spread of ideology out of France and into other parts of Europe. This look at democracy brought the first semblance of national feeling to Italian provinces since the days of the Roman Empire. The Italian population, however, less literate than that of France, was slower to adopt the concepts that Napoleon introduced. They also were upset that the French did not pay proper respect to the Pope, but they soon began to accept French administration and, by learning from it and working in it, were ultimately able to benefit from it. End quote. 
There's actually a little more to the Italian war than Davis mentions, although we can forgive him for being brief. Following the fall of Mantua, Napoleon doesn't defeat the Austrians right away. First, he has to turn south and deal with the Pope, who is attacking his supply lines with a force of 7,000 men. A 9,000-man French division turns south, defeats the papal army on February 9th, and forces the Pope into a formal peace treaty, where he officially signs away his rights to Avignon, that small territory in eastern France that the French had seized during the constitutional monarchy. The Pope also cedes the cities of Ancona, Bologna, Ferrara, and Ravenna, giving Napoleon control of most of Italy north of Rome. Not only that, but the French are allowed to go through the Vatican and seize a number of valuable artworks to cover papal war indemnities. And since the army is supplying itself in the field, you can bet that, at least in the papal states, there's plenty of unofficial pillaging involved. This general pillage of artworks and other valuables isn't unique to the Vatican, it is endemic to the entire war. French cultural enrichment aside, by advancing through the wealthy region of northern Italy, Napoleon's men have gotten far better loot than the men fighting in Germany, who have been conquering and reconquering the same few beleaguered villages over and over again. This, along with his successes in the field, makes Napoleon a uniquely popular commander. The other thing I should point out is that Napoleon's negotiations with the Austrians are purely informal. He actually has no real authority to negotiate peace terms, but his conquests have made him such an important figure that the deal he works out ends up being more or less the final peace treaty. This will include the achievement of all French war goals. France controls her natural borders, and Austria gives up all claim to the Austrian Netherlands. The Rhine becomes the official boundary of France and the Holy Roman Empire, and both sides will have freedom of navigation on the river. The creation of the Cisalpine and Ligurian republics in Italy will bring an end to the old Kingdom of Italy which is more of a loose common defense league than a kingdom, but which has served the Habsburgs for centuries. But Napoleon is also looking for a stable peace, and he wants to compensate the Austrians for the loss of the Austrian Netherlands. To do this, he decides to divide up the neutral Republic of Venice, with the Austrians taking Venice's mainland territory and France taking most of the Mediterranean islands. In June of 1797, there is an official motion in the French government to disavow Napoleon's partition of Venice, saying that it violates the law of nations. During the conquest of the city, some of his troops had been accused of killing civilians. Napoleon denies this and responds in a letter to the entire directory, quote, This motion was printed by order of the assembly. It is evident, then, that the passage is directed against me. I was entitled, after having five times concluded peace and given a death blow to the coalition, if not to civic triumphs, at least to live tranquilly under the protection of the first magistrates of the republic. At present, I find myself ill-treated, persecuted, and disparaged by every shameful means which their policy brings to the aid of persecution. I would have been indifferent to all, except that species of opprobrium with which the first magistrates of the Republic endeavor to overwhelm me. After having deserved well of my country by my last act, I am not bound to hear myself accused in a manner as absurd as atrocious." I have not expected that a manifesto, signed by emigrants paid by England, should obtain more credit with the Council of 500 than the evidence of 80,000 men, than mine. End quote. The division of Venice is controversial with many in France, not just because it's a neutral power that had nothing to do with the war, 
and not even because of any supposed massacres. Until now, French armies have been installing Republican governments wherever they have taken over territory. Napoleon has just broken up a free republic and given most of it to the Austrian monarchy. In the end, it won't matter. In light of his other accomplishments, his treatment of Venice will soon be forgotten. Napoleon's peace negotiations with the Austrians begin in April of 1797, but an official peace treaty won't be signed until October, because both sides are dragging their feet and trying to gain an advantage. Most of the delay can be chalked up to another French election in April. Between the Council of 500 and the Council of Ancients, 260 seats are in play, that's 250 seats, one-third of all of the seats, plus 10 seats held by people who have either retired or died in office. And all of these seats have been held by former members of the National Convention. In yet another low-turnout election, a total of 11 of these men are re-elected, all of them conservatives. The other 249 seats go to new men, 182 of whom are constitutional monarchists, 44 of whom support not just a return to monarchy, but a return to the Ancien Regime, and only 34 of whom are liberals, including Napoleon's older brother, Joseph Bonaparte. While this election doesn't give the royalists an outright majority in the government, the writing on the wall is clear. One more election like this, and there will be enough royalists in the legislature to return the monarchy by a simple vote. The new French government may have a lot of royalists, but not all of them can agree on who they want to restore to the throne. Some are lobbying for the Comte de Provence, Louis XVIII because he's Louis XVI's oldest brother and therefore next in line for the throne. But others want to forego the formal order of succession and go with the younger brother, future King Charles X. Louis XVIII is an authoritarian who wants to return France to the days of the Ancien Regime. He wants the feudal system back in place and no more rights for the third estate. It's not as if this is some conspiracy theory. Louis XVIII has actually issued a statement called the Declaration of Verona, where he has called for France to eliminate all changes made since 1789 and punish all revolutionaries, even those who had worked for a constitutional monarchy. This is too far for most royalists, who prefer a return to constitutional monarchy and not to the Ancien Regime. Charles X is more liberal than his older brother, and would be able to build consensus among a wider swath of the French population, so he garners support from this group of royalists. Unable to advance the idea of any particular king during their first months in power, the pro-Louis and pro-Charles royalists nonetheless act as a coalition to pass other conservative measures. Oh, yeah, and some of them are also supporting Philippe Egalité's son, Louis-Philippe, the new Duc d'Orléans and the first Prince of the Blood. And Louis-Philippe himself will also become king a few decades down the road, so there is that. Anyway... The conservatives are led by none other than Jean-Charles Pichigrou, the guy who had secretly given French battle plans to the Austrians. He's now been elected president of the Council of 500, and he manages to make several changes. To begin with, he tries to repair ties with the Catholic Church. A large number of exiled priests return to France, although the left still has enough power to require that all priests take an oath of loyalty to the state. This is not the same as the old civic oath, which was an oath of obedience to the state, and most priests are willing to take a simple oath of loyalty. 
Pichegru's government also throws a bone to the emigres. Eliminating a law that had banned the relatives of emigres and former emigres from holding office. These are things you might expect from a more conservative government. But then, Pichegru tries to eliminate the directory's budget and force the directors to ask the conservative controlled treasury for money whenever they need it. This might just be part of the general belt tightening that everybody, right and left, knows is necessary in the French government. But it also has the effect of undermining the directory's executive power. Not only is this a threat to the directory's members, but it's seen as a prelude to restoring the monarchy. If you're going to bring back a king, you can't have a strong executive already in the government. So, step one towards a restoration would be to weaken or eliminate the existing executive branch. Regardless, this effort fails. While Pichegru's motion passes the Council of 500, the Council of the Ancients vetoes it, and the Directory maintains control over their own finances. For now. All of this is terrifying to French Republicans. The new oath for the clergy is a necessary move on its face. 18th century France is, by and large, a devoutly Catholic country, and you're not going to gain the support of the people without making some kind of peace with the Catholic Church. But Keep in mind that the non-juring priests have spent the last few years being deprived of their pay, hunted by government agents, and executed if they were caught exercising their priestly functions. If they didn't start out as royalists, they're sure going to be royalists now, and they're going to be preaching royalism from the pulpit. As for the attempt to defund the directory, it's not merely a swipe at executive power, which would be bad enough. It's also intended to tie up funds for the war, force French armies into a stalemate, and convince French diplomats to make a more conciliatory peace with the Austrians. All of which, again, is meant to pave the way for a smooth transition back to monarchy. Even without control of the directory, the conservatives now control the treasury and all the government ministries and are just biding their time until another election gives them complete control of the government. One of the first orders of business for the new government is the selection of a new directory member. As I said, one of the five directors is to be replaced each year, but what I didn't mention is that the director to be replaced is chosen by lot. To recap, we have Lazare Carnot and Etienne Francois Le Tournier, both military technocrats who run the army and the navy respectively. We have Louis Marie de Revelier and Jean Francois Rubel, both center left liberals and staunch republicans, and we have Paul Barat who is an opportunist but also a staunch Republican, even if only out of self-interest. If La Revelière, Rubel, or Barat comes up for a replacement, the conservatives can neutralize the pro-Republican majority on the directory and get the executive branch of the government to participate in its own dismantling. But when they draw lots, it's the Navy technocrat Letournier who comes up for replacement. Some historians think Barat rigged the selection process, others think it's blind luck, but either way, when Le Tournier is replaced by conservative diplomat François Barthélemy on May 20th, 1797, it doesn't have much effect on how the directory votes. It's around this point that Barat, Rubel, and La Revelière start working together to prevent the conservatives from taking over the government. The so-called triumvirate, this group of three men, is dealing with an interesting moral quandary. What do you do when the people in a republic want to revert to a monarchy? Is the will of the people still sovereign? 
or are they free to vote for anything they want other than a change in government? To put it another way, is it ever acceptable to violate the Constitution in order to protect well, the Constitution? There's no right or wrong answer. Historians, political scientists, and philosophers have argued the point many times. But the members of the new triumvirate, Barat, Rubel, and La Ravelliere, say yes. Now that they've decided to launch a coup, the next question is how to carry it out. Prior revolutionary coups have relied on the Paris mob to overthrow the government. But with the sans culottes now powerless, their assemblies abolished, and gangs of golden youth patrolling the streets, the idea of a popular uprising is out of the question. Instead, the triumvirate is going to have to rely on the military. At this time, the summer of 1797, they have three leaders to choose from. Jean Moreau, one of the commanders on the Rhine, Lazare Hoche, who had foiled the Royalist Kiberon Bay expedition and is now commanding other troops on the Rhine, and Napoleon Bonaparte. Moreau is out for political reasons. See, several months ago, he had discovered a collection of letters between Pichegru, Louis XVIII, and the Austrians, proving Pichegru's betrayal and the sharing of French war plans. But rather than share these letters with the directory, Jean Moreau had sat on them. He and Pichegru are old friends, and he doesn't want to betray a friend. But then, Napoleon had gotten wind of Pichegru's betrayal, obtained copies of the letters, and forwarded everything to Paul Barat. So now, not only is the directory aware that Pichegru, the head of the Council of 500, well, he's an out-and-out -out traitor, but the directory is also faced with the fact that General Moreau, while not a traitor himself, is willing to turn a blind eye to treason to protect an old friend. On the plus side, with Pichegru's treason now a proven fact, Carnot joins the triumvirate in their little coup attempt. Moreau's unreliability leaves two choices to lead the military side of the coup. Those are Hoche and Bonaparte. And Bonaparte is too busy negotiating with the Austrians at gunpoint to run back to Paris and participate in a coup, so it's up to Lazar Hoche to save the Republic from itself. On July 1st, 1797, the directors order Hoche to lead an army from the Rhine back to western France. Along the way, he's supposed to stop in Paris to resupply and give his men a little R&R. &R. This is illegal. Under French revolutionary law, much like in the old Roman Republic, armies are supposed to stay clear of the capital region, with only designated garrison units allowed to carry weapons in the city. No matter. The Directory is violating the Constitution to save the Constitution. On July 14, 1797, the eight-year anniversary of the storming of the Bastille, Hoche's troops are in position. With the not-so-subtle threat of armed violence, the Directory goes ahead and fires a bunch of conservative government ministers and replaces them with their own men. These include the Treasury Minister, as well as the Minister of War, who is replaced by Lazar Hoche. But Hoche only remains in place for nine days before he realizes that Barat intends to purge the entire government. Then he resigns his post and returns to the Rhine frontier. The new Minister of War is another political functionary whose name is unimportant. What is important for our purposes is that Talleyrand, remember him? Well, this is when he is appointed foreign minister on July 15th, and he immediately strikes up a correspondence with Napoleon, flattering him for his victories and praising his diplomatic skill in negotiating with the Austrians. 
Napoleon is now the Directory's last chance of completing their coup, and Barat asks him to send a general to command the Paris troops. After a little wheedling from both Barat and Talleyrand, Napoleon agrees on one condition that his negotiations with the Austrians be recognized as legitimate and written into the formal peace treaty. Barat agrees, and Napoleon dispatches one of his subordinates, General Pierre Augereau, to lead the Parisian troops. With Augereau in place, the directors are ready to launch their coup, which they do on September 4, 1797, or 18 Fructidor. The coup of 18 Fructidor, as historians call it, sees the expulsion of most newly elected members of the Council of 500 and the Council of the Ancients. The Directory does this by declaring that the elections in 49 French departments are invalid and sending in troops to expel the disqualified delegates. 65 delegates, including Pichegru, are arrested and deported to French Guiana. An additional 112 are removed from office but permitted to remain in France. This will not be the end of General Pichegru. He will eventually flee French Guiana for the Dutch colony of Suriname, board a ship for the United States, and travel back to London where he meets up with some Russian military brass and ends up advising a later campaign against the French. But we'll talk about that in the next episode. The Directory doesn't just purge the legislature, it also purges itself and removes Lazar Carnot in the just-appointed François Barthélemy, replacing them with a pair of former Jacobins. Barthélemy is exiled to Guiana with Pichegru, but Carnot manages to escape. It seems like a pretty raw deal here. He had gone along with the coup after all, but he is a technocrat and not a liberal, so he is removed. But that's okay, because he will soon make a brilliant comeback as Minister of War under Napoleon where he will serve from 1800 to 1804. He'll also return to command in 1812 and again in 1815, and will eventually be permanently exiled by the new royalist government. During his life, he will also make a number of inventions related to engineering and fortifications, and he'll even make some key contributions to the science of geometry. He dies in Prussia in 1823, and his remains will be transferred to the Pantheon in Paris in 1889. The next year will mark a period known as the Directorial Terror. During this time, which begins in the fall of 1797, dozens of right-leaning newspapers will be shut down and their editors deported. There will be a small number of anti-directory uprisings in cities throughout France, most of which will be put down within 24 hours. The directory will appoint military commissioners for the entire country, crack down again on non-juring priests and imprison around a thousand of them, and also deport a few hundred more private individuals. But the term terror is probably misused here at least in comparison to the Reign of Terror. In total, only 160 people will be executed during the Directorial Terror, compared to the Reign of Terror's tens of thousands of victims. Earlier, I compared the French Revolution to an earthquake with a series of aftershocks, and as with a real earthquake, the aftershocks are getting smaller and smaller. On October 17th, the French and Austrians signed the Treaty of Campo Formio, formally ending the War of the First Coalition. The treaty goes along the lines Napoleon had negotiated, and it looks like it allows an amicable and stable peace. But if we look a little closer, we can identify the seeds of future conflict. 
First is the Austrian takeover of Venice, which ensures that in any future war, the Austrians and the French-Italian allies won't be separated by the Alps. Instead, Austria will begin the war with a foothold in northern Italy. The second issue is the city of Cologne, which sits on the west side of the Rhine. While Austria has agreed to set the border at the Rhine, Cologne is a Prussian possession and remains an exception to the treaty between the Prussians and the French, which had set their border at the Rhine. So in any future war against Prussia, Prussia and France won't start out on opposite sides of the river. Prussia will have a foothold on the West Bank, much as the Austrians will have one in Italy. So after five years of war, France has still just barely failed to secure its natural borders. Meanwhile, the war with Britain continues. As will happen in the 20th century, Britain stands alone for a time against an aggressive European power that has conquered or pacified all of its continental neighbors. But the British are in a poor state for fighting. Hard currency is almost as scarce in Britain as it is in France, and the Bank of England is forced to declare that banknotes are no longer redeemable for gold, a policy that will last until well after the fall of Napoleon. Inflation threatens to sink the economy, and there are widespread protests against the government. The only thing that saves the British economy is an alliance of patriotic businessmen who pledge to continue accepting paper money at face value. This stabilizes the British pound and averts the threat of hyperinflation. But the currency crisis isn't Britain's only problem. In 1796, French privateers sink or capture 700 British merchant ships, which is more than the British can afford to replace. So, in 1797, the government requires all merchants to sail with military escorts, which stretches the Royal Navy to its breaking point. Georges Lefebvre writes, quote, Great Britain found herself alone at grips with France, which, sooner or later, could take advantage of the revolt that had already begun in Ireland. At this very moment, the fleet, bulwark of the island, mutinied. Political agitation played no part in it. The appalling life of the sailors, who were poorly fed, paid at 17th century rates, deprived of leave and treated with pitiless brutality, reduced them to despair. Seeing their complaints disregarded, they rose at Spithead on April 16, 1797. Within a month, however, they were forced to submit, after having obtained some satisfaction. Meanwhile, the North Sea Fleet at the mouth of the Thames had followed their example. It was joined by part of Duncan's fleet, cruising off Holland, and land forces began to show signs of unrest. Concessions and an amnesty which reduced the number of those hanged to 23, including the leader Richard Parker, finally restored order, but only in mid-June. End quote. So, why don't the British make peace, now that the first coalition has fallen apart and they're starting to have trouble at home? The first, simplest answer is that they still face a profound national security threat. France controls the entire British-facing coast of Europe, which gives it enough power to throttle British trade with the continent, an unacceptable situation for a mercantile nation like Great Britain. The second, longer answer is that Talleyrand is playing both sides during peace negotiations. He sees the weakness of the Directory and the ongoing political popularity of French royalists and he keeps advising the British to hold out for a new French government in a better deal. As always, Talleyrand is putting his own interests first, ingratiating himself with the British, making friends with this 
brilliant new military commander named Napoleon, and all the while making a fortune in bribes and shady business deals. The coup of 18 Fructidor marks the end of what historians call the First Directory and the beginning of what they call the Second Directory. Outwardly, the form of government remains unchanged, but inwardly, the executive branch, led by Paul Barat, has formed a new collective dictatorship. For the rest of the Directory's existence, no law will be passed, no policy enacted, that does not meet with the approval of the five directors. The royalists have been defeated. The sans remain powerless. Former Jacobins are once again in power throughout the country, but none of them have the influence of the old Jacobins who had been purged after the fall of Robespierre. If the new government is to survive, it must rely on the military to maintain control and control of the military now goes through one person, Napoleon Bonaparte. In the next episode, we'll talk about the rest of Napoleon's achievements, from the invasion of Egypt to his coronation as emperor, from his domestic reforms to his many wars against overwhelming odds. At the end, we'll talk about his return during the Hundred Days, his final defeat, the restoration of the monarchy, and the legacy of the French Revolution. All that and more in the next episode of Relevant History. again. It's Dan, here to remind you that a Relevant History Patreon subscription now only costs $1 a month. So if you've been on the fence about subscribing, now is a great opportunity to get access to all 24 episodes of my video series, Dan's War College, along with the Relevant History Discord channel where you can chat with me and other patrons. Access to the Discord will remain $1 indefinitely, but access to Dan's War College is for a limited time only. Once I get back to recording new episodes, only $5 patrons will have access. So get in now while the offer's still good. Link in the description. If you just want to read the occasional show update as well as random blurbs about sports and politics and whatever else is on my mind, you can find me on X, uh, better known as the app formerly known as Twitter, at at Dan Toller Podcast. That's at Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. If you want to correct an error, request an interview, or just say hi, you can reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. You can find other links, including some past interviews at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Finally, sharing an episode with your friends is the best way to help the show and grow the audience. So if you like what you're hearing, please give Relevant History a shout out on social media, Reddit, or wherever else you hang out online. It makes a big difference. And best of all, sharing is totally free. Thanks for listening.